welcome to Kurt Vonnegut Guys, the podcast dedicated to the life and works and ongoing things of Kurt Vonnegut because he's the greatest author of all time. My name is Alex Schmidt, and I'm joined as always by my co-host, Michael Swaim. Howdy, howdy, howdy. Howdy, howdy, howdy. Schlacht Hof Fünf. <laughs> Repeat after me. Schlacht Hof Fünf. This is your home now. Our German fans are going wild. They know no. what this is. And the rest of you, like, oh, or those who have read or the even Zwei. No, no. It's Fünf, baby. Worst, worst <laughs> one. <laughs> forget it. Yeah. Via, forget it. Fünf. That's where we are. <laughs> For our non-German fans, Alex, what the hell's going on? <laughs> <laughs> this is our episode about Slaughterhouse Five. Oh. It's a pretty famous Kurt Vonnegut novel from 1969. And now I understand are. why I said the things I said. <laughs> <laughs> So we're very excited to be doing this one. Welcome back if you're coming off of our Monkey House episode or mm. our From the Group mini. Still so. coming down from that. But here we are with Slaughterhouse 5, and let's get into it with a segment called Plot Time. Whoa, segments coming fast and furious tick, tick, right tick, up tick, top. Tick, 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 tick. Did you see that Super Bowl? How about that, that, that pass? <laughs> <laughs> How about that one pass? Really r- rocketed it in there. Really amazing. Mm-hmm. And this is a book that is about a guy who is unstuck in time, and mm-hmm. it jumps between eras, probably page to page. So our summary of the plot might be a little bit disjointed. But oh, we're the plot summary is going to be rough, yeah, because I realize that. the book leaps around, and I was kind of furiously re-going through, like, okay, where does the plot go? Because yeah. it's everywhere. Basically, I think what we're going to have to do is do our best, and note up top, as we're doing now, that we might present all the scenes out of order. But that's okay, because they all happen, and it's kind of the point of the book, is that it doesn't matter. Yeah. It does matter, but as they say in the book, Tralfamador, the planet from Sirens, will feature heavily in this as well. And the Tralfamadorians say that, or at least they view time all at once rather than linearly. Yeah. So a Tralfamadorian book or piece of art is a sequence of images, moments, or thoughts all presented simultaneously, and the only craft you can bring to it is those elements go well together or make you come away with meaning. But it's impossible to sequence them, so you have to see everything at once. Yeah. Which is my excuse for why. So that's what we're doing. (laughs) Uh, But yeah, so because of that, I think intentionally to mimic that, the book is written in a Tralfamadorian style, I would say. Like, the book is a sequence of scenes in thought order rather than in any kind of time order that would make sense. I'm glad you brought up that Tralfamadorian book thing, because that is one of my favorite things in it, where they're looking at one of their books, and it just looks like a series of dots. And they say, yeah, each dot in it means something, and just you experience the dots in whatever order. All at once, yeah. That's great. Sort of like uh, Arrival, the language of the aliens in Arrival. Yeah. Obviously, that was had no time element, but you know what I mean. They had that circular language that you sort of read all at once or with a different context. This book, I think the main thing it strives to do in two ways is to get you to see life in a very different context that's probably alien to you if you're like me. Maybe not veterans, but A, to view time in this unique way, and then B, to view the horrors of war in a really direct way and meditate on that. So the book does a good job of both. And as they say, it starts with the line, listen, Billy Pilgrim has become unstuck in time. And the last line is pooty wheat, which is what a bird says. Yeah. And that's accurate. But how can he say that's the first line of the book when the first line of the book is actually the first line of this book will be... Do right. you see what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah, this is... I feel like when we talked about his previous novels, we keep finding that the intro or the preface or just the stuff on a page before the story starts is incredibly it's important. fascinating. It's like yeah. structurally essential to the whole book. And so in Slaughterhouse, this is the first book where he realizes, oh, my intros and prefaces are so important. They should just be the first chapter where it's me talking to you. Right, because so many people I think will skip the preface thinking yeah. that I'll read it later if I love this book, but I don't need to read it to start the story. Yeah. And Vonnegut finally realized, oh, people aren't reading my prefaces, and I put a lot of effort into those. So yeah. <laughs> there's 10 chapters or nine chapters in the book, I don't remember, and chapter one is the preface. Like, it should be called preface or introduction. Yeah. It's totally unrelated and is written from the point of view of Kurt just explaining what this book is about and why he wrote it. And I just love that he tricked you into re- making you read the introduction by just calling it chapter one. There's no way out. <laughs> what, are you going to not read chapter one and then read yeah. the rest of the book? You'd ha! be insane. 
Yeah. He also, incidentally, in that introduction, two episodes ago, I said, what's the name for the thing at the beginning of a book, like the little quotation? I said, epitaph. It's epigraph. Oh, yeah. Obviously, we all know what an epitaph is, but epigraph. It's deaf. Yeah. Vocab word. It's uh, when call, someone yeah. dies in Oregon Trail and you write, they died of butts exactly. on their gravestone. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so the epigraph in Slaughterhouse Five is, the cattle are lowing, the baby awakes, but the little Lord Jesus, no crying he makes. And uh, I love this one because unlike Mr. Rosewater, where I could never figure out what the epigraph meant, and I'm still trying to turn it over in my mind, he says in the book why that's the epigraph. Yeah. And it's because Billy Pilgrim, our main character, who survived the bombing of Dresden in World War II, has seen many, many, many things that should make you cry, but he doesn't. Yeah. And he, he goes on to say, the... that's probably the only thing he has in common with baby Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Just the one way. Just the one thing. Yeah. And also with his previous books, we've meditated on each of the dedications, like why he dedicated it to someone. Yeah. And it's mainly just because we're super fascinated with Kurt, and it's mainly just things that are personal to Kurt. But this book is dedicated to two people, and he also tells you why in the book, just yeah. like with the epigraph. It's dedicated to Mary O'Hare and Gerhard Müller. And then also the title of this book is technically massive. It's mm. You think, oh, Slaughterhouse-Five, but it's technically Slaughterhouse-Five or The Children's Crusade. A Duty Dance with Death by Kurt Vonnegut. And then my edition has like another paragraph on the title page of just what it is. It's a fourth generation German American now living in easy circumstances on Cape Cod. Oh, yeah. And smoking too much, who as an American infantry scout or to combat as a prisoner of war, witnessed the firebombing of Dresden, Germany. And it goes on and on. You can keep it's reading it. It's a real it. Fiona Apple album but, of a... <laughs> right. The title is The Entire Circumstances of the Book and What Happens sure. in it. It's like, it reminds me of there was an era in fiction where it was popular to say like, Chapter the 17th, wherein Mr. Tuttlebottom <laughs> finds right. someone in his boat, and it turns out it's a pig in a hat. Right. And you're like, well, why do I have to read it? The chapter title was everything that happens. <laughs> I love that. That's great. Yeah, and it's sort of like how he did a lot of the Cat's Cradle chapter titles, where it says, oh, this two pages, this is what happens in yeah. the two pages. And he tracked, so he started one of the books with, this book is completely made up, everything's fake. That was the opening image he wanted you to know and then he started another book which was equally a blend of fake and real with this is all real i want you to now this time when i when you read it i forget which one it was he's like this time i want you to think this is all real and really happened oh well mother night i think it's 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 all real and then there's but there's one is a cat's cradle where he says none of this really happened yeah and i just think it's interesting that the actual first line of chapter one slash the preface is all of this happened more or less Right. So this really, Slaughterhouse-Five, and I'm not just bringing that up because it's weird. I think it's intentional. A main question of the book is, is this real? Is this really happening? Which I have read this book many times as a young person, and I never once questioned that it was literally, truly sci-fi. This is the first time reading it that I thought, oh, there's another interpretation, which is that he's suffering from PTSD flashbacks. Yeah, yeah. And there is no sci-fi. And... I think that's very intentionally just ensconced in the opening line. All this happened more or less, meaning like open invitation to view this as a sci-fi novel or the Hurt Locker. Right. Like it is either one. And I got to say, it's a really masterful use of fiction. And I think it's a great evolution of things he's tried in the past in his pieces. But I did like the story as a sci-fi buff a lot better when I was like, oh, it's definitely sci-fi. Now that I realize that there's an obvious interpretation where it's, oh, he's just trauma struck and he's not truly unstuck in time. It just feels that way to him. It makes me feel like he chickened out (laughs) or it makes me feel bad that Slaughterhouse-Five is his A number one hit. And I'm not saying that it's not incredible because it is, but it was like he had to present a book to the world and say... It doesn't have to be sci-fi, though, for people to be like, <laughs> you got a hit there. Oh. You know what like I mean? Like, he wasn't, he wasn't brave enough to just go full he on. He can't. He definitely, many times in the book, restrains himself from, like, in Sirens of Titan, where he'd go full hog and say, like, this is what's happening on this planet, and the aliens yeah. are like this, and this happens. They literally went to Mercury, and they peeled these aliens exactly. off the walls. Yeah. In this book, there's all the sci-fi imagination like in most of his books, but it's very carefully ensconced within Billy's brain. No one ever 
outside of Billy ever experiences or believes that it's true that he's unstuck in time. Right. I honestly think it was a tactic so that you, the reader of this era, when it first came out, could be like, oh, it's a serious war novel. Yeah. Rather than he didn't want you to think like it's a crazy Twilight Zone World War II thing, you know? I feel like he might agree with you because especially in that first chapter, it's a lot about him in real life figuring out how to approach the book and going on a trip to Germany with his friend Bernard O'Hare and trying to figure it out. And then at the end of the first chapter, he just says, anyway, this is my attempt at a Dresden book and it's a failure. Here it is, which yeah. is a really unusual thing. And I, I remember being stunned by it when I read this as a kid because I was like, oh my God. But it's so disingenuous because he gave it an A plus in the right. end. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a standard stand-up comedian's technique. To come out and go like, oh, this already isn't going well. Right. <laughs> like, but I have, yeah, you rarely see an author say like, you really shouldn't take this book too seriously because I suck. Okay, yeah. let's get going. <laughs> what segment are we even in? <laughs> oh, just whatever we like. It's the best show. It's, uh, fun. it's <laughs> funny. I think we're instinctively not wanting to get around to like, okay, the plot of this book. cut to <laughs> the most human beings ever killed in one attack. <laughs> yeah. And Kurt even... In not just the chapters where he's being himself talking to you, but himself and Billy Pilgrim, this book has a lot of people reading other real books and quoting from them. And it's yes. partly so he can establish that the firebombing of Dresden, a thing that Kurt lived through, a thing that Kurt tried to turn into a novel for years, was one of the most horrific events of World War II. And he even pretty pointedly picks out that, well, the body count in Dresden was actually higher than the atomic bomb on uh, Which Hiroshima. Was shocking news to me and, and also the firebombing of tokyo was higher body counts and it's it's a brutal part of the war that we forget about because it ooh. wasn't atomic have you seen grave of the fireflies no i don't know what that is incredible anime film about a brother and sister struggling to survive after the firebombing of tokyo oh it sounds great just little kids basically in the situation this guy's in at the end of the book but little kids living on the moon you know there's nothing left and they have no parents and they it's awesome. Oh, great. <laughs> very good. Yeah. Very, very good. So, yeah, it's the, more fatal than the atomic bombs. And I think underreported in part because the invention of the nuclear age stole the thunder. So yeah. Kurt basically wants to shed new light on that particular event and how awful it was. It yeah. gets more sophisticated than that, but... Well, any, the any, need of the book is that it would have been terrible to be in a firebombing. Well, and it, within the book, he literally writes in a character, Bertram Copeland Rumford, who's trying to tackle the history of Dresden from a, well, you know, he had to do it and compare it to the rest of the war. And then literally exactly. Billy is like, nah, I was there. It was very different. Yeah. There's a segment, and we should eventually start going in order of the plot, <laughs> but there's a segment where that guy who they call BC, another, I think, awesome name because he represents the old style of thinking, BC yeah. Rumford. And um, also just that every part of his name is so old sounding, yeah, like yeah. Bertram. But Ugh. also it reminded me of the section in Mr. Rosewater where Lister got to talk and Vonnegut didn't make him a straw man. Like he has some good points because you're obviously incredibly sympathetic with Billy, who's in fucking sh horror and shock his whole life ever since this event. And how can you not understand the human tragedy and toll and blah, blah, blah. And then uh, this guy, BC Rumford is like the points you would make on the other side, which are valid, which is many more Americans died fighting Nazis than died in that firebombing. Did yeah. you want there to keep being concentration camps? What did you want us to do? Yeah. I'm proud that we all did that. And the firebombing of Dresden, it's not good. Those people died, but I'm glad we made all the choices we made because now there's no Hitler and Nazis and stuff. And, yeah. uh, and he also argues it's also that hard the, to argue against. And he argues that the Nazis started the war, which you can look back at World War One and try to figure out whose fault World War Two is. But I mean, yeah, and you can to look an back extent they did. You know, a hundred thousand years Eastern and Europe. be like the right. Sumerians really shouldn't have invaded <laughs> Egypt, and none of this shit would have happened. Right, the Akkadians. Right, to the, uh, right. <laughs> who was the first aggressor? Cain and Abel, I guess. Yeah, the story of the book. We're, what we're literally story? talking about, because chapter one, and I think it's chapter 10 is the end, or from Kurt's perspective, yeah. talking about his own book. It's not a long book. That'll yeah. save us. We've dallied and a it's lot, not long. but it's short. <laughs> but the, the middle of the book is about Billy Pilgrim, who becomes unstuck in time in 1944 while he's in World War II, and then sees his entire life and bounces around between different parts of his life 
throughout his existence. And he's able to see from its beginning to his death, he's able to see his abduction by aliens from Tralfamador and being kept in an alien zoo. And he's able to see his marriage and his kids and everything else in between. I say Tralfamador, we will have a Twitter poll to determine <laughs> the proper pronunciation when this episode drops. So vote yeah, on it's also, Tralfamador or Tralfamador. It's weird that I, because I, I, I haven't done this as an audiobook, but I've consumed the movie of this and a radio play of this and I forget how they do it completely. It's That's true. I head. blanked it out when yeah. I, you'd think I would have been like, think, aha, <laughs> Alex, come over here. <laughs> yeah. So chapter one's just talking about the book. Yeah. I want to call out that he said when he told his publisher, you know, I'm going to make a war book. The guy was like, is it an anti-war book? And he's like, yeah, I guess so. Cause that's my stance on war. It sucks. And he's yeah. like, you know what you should do? You should write an anti-glacier book instead. And then Vonnegut says, what he meant, of course, was that there would always be wars and that they were as easy to stop as glaciers. I believe that, too. And the only reason I'm dragging us back in time no, no. is uh, I think he might have found some wry humor and hope in the fact that it's looking like glaciers will be gone before war. I think I war will thought. outlive glaciers for quite <laughs> some time. Yeah, well, because with the timeliness of this book, for one thing, it was released right when the Vietnam War was at its most wearying for the American people yeah. in 1969. And so there's some Vietnam elements to it that I think it still plays with or without. Totally. Like it's about so many different things and so many fundamental things that yeah. you don't have to be in Vietnam. But then also there are little timely things like that where I, I was reading it too and I was like, yeah, the glaciers are receding. <laughs> yeah, and it's yeah. actually And war is still changing. doing fine. <laughs> and I also love in chapter one how he tells you what the climax of the book is going to be. And then, as Kurt is wont to do, to reveal the end of the book at the beginning, it's one of his favorite tricks. But this yeah. time it's done really well, I thought, because he basically says he's on the phone with an old, his old war buddy talking about how he's going to write the book you're reading now. And he says, uh, I think the climax will be when poor old Edgar Derby got shot. Don't you think? I mean, the irony is so great. Hundreds of thousands of people killed and we survive. And then the next day, he's randomly shot for stealing a teapot, even though everyone was stealing and no one cared. Isn't that ironic? And the guy's like, I don't know, I guess so. Good ending, I guess. <laughs> and when you actually get to the end of the book and that happens, it's the literary equivalent of off screen, basically. Yeah. You get to it and he's like, oh, yeah, this is the part in there somewhere where Edgar Derby got shot also. And I just love that. It's fucking sad in a profound yeah. way. Very much like No Country, taking your... Uh, like such a crucial thing and throwing it away to be like, that's what life does, man. Right. These things that should be important just go by quickly and um, you only have your memories of it, you know? That movie's incredible, especially the end of that movie. It's just, it's Ooh, great. So good. I feel like part of why Kurt realized this first chapter shouldn't just be a preface is that it has amazing stuff in it. Like it's, re it's really, really crucial and important. But even for his intros and prefaces, this is next level. Like it's really, it's got that kind of thing. Yeah, it's fabulous. Well, also we should, the two people dedicated to one of them. First page, Gerhard Mueller is the cab driver driving around Kurt and his real life fellow POW friend, Bernard V. O'Hare. He's driving them around Dresden on a trip back after the war to research this book and try to figure out what he'd do with it. And Gerhard writes them a very nice card afterward. And part of it says that he hopes they'll meet again, quote, if the accident will. You know, which is, uh, Great Kurt line. likes it quite a bit as a way to talk about fate and, and destiny. He says, and... I like that, if the accident will. Yeah. It's basically a paraphrase of Sirens of Titan, you know, a yeah. victim of a series of accidents. Yeah. And then also the other dedication to Mary O'Hare comes from before the trip, Kurt is visiting Bernard and his wife, Mary O'Hare, at their home. And he has a really awkward time of it because Mary is clearly furious at them. And Bernard is just like saying it's fine, but it's not fine. Right. And then eventually Mary confronts them and says, you're going to write another one of these stupid war movies where a bunch of heroic guys do a bunch of heroic things. When in actuality, everybody was babies and they were just shooting at each other because they were told to and they didn't know what to do. Yeah, and, Kurt and he's like, no, 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 you're thinking I'm going to do the second half of Full Metal Jacket. I'm doing the first half of Full yeah. Metal Jacket. <laughs> and she's like, oh, okay. I don't get that reference yet, but yeah. that sounds better. <laughs> I'm not a Kubrick scholar, she yeah. said. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> she said in 1949 or whatever. <laughs> but he promises that it'll be a book with no parts for, I think it's Frank Sinatra and John Wayne. Yeah, like the, and he promises that he'll subtitle it Children's Crusade because... Yeah. In her honor, in honor of that observation. Yeah. And then they read about the actual Children's Crusade in history for a while, right. in case you've never heard of it. Well, yeah, and which you didn't know don't is, Wikipedia. 
The Crusades are when we basically did what we're doing now, which is we teamed all the Christians up against all the Muslims. <laughs> and uh, we were even more uh, rude about it than we are today, if you can imagine. We sent vast armies over there to kill as many as possible. When we ran out of able-bodied people to send, they sent a final army over of just like orphans with swords. Yeah. And that was the Children's Crusade. And, and they were like, trust us, God hates those people. March over there and attack them till you all die. Yeah. Kill as many as you can. And the, <laughs> and the crusade wasn't even really a war. It was just a scam to gather child slaves. Most yeah. of the children oh. who were recruited were just immediately sent to slavery. Most of them, once <laughs> they arrived, right, there were deals in place where they're like, surprise, you thought you were getting marched to certain death. You're actually getting marched to me, who am now going to own you as a slave and sell you off. Yeah. Which is worse. Hard to say. <laughs> right. Are you pleased by the surprise or displeased? Yeah. I don't even know. Also, it's like, oh, you thought you were going to get a book about the horrors of the firebombing of Dresden? We got extra horrors, man. Oh, History's terrible. Here yeah. it comes. You know? Which I think is why he ends chapter one by saying, people aren't supposed to look back. I'm certainly not going to do it anymore. I've finished my war book now. The next one I write is going to be fun. <laughs> By the way, what's the next novel he wrote? Do you know? It was Breakfast of Champions. That is fun. It's more fun. It's more fun than this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> this novel's a failure and had to be since it was written by a pillar of salt. Yeah. Get it? Because he looked back. Yeah, like yeah, Lot's wife. Lot's wife. In the Bible. And as he says, the book begins like this. Listen, Billy Pilgrim has come unstuck on time. It ends like this. Pooty wheat. Chapter two. Yeah. And so <laughs> can, we, we, can we get to the events of the story? <laughs> yeah. I also feel like most of his novels leading up to this were consciously or not training for writing something this meta and this outside of uh -huh. its own story. And so uh, if you're listening and saying, when are they going to get to Billy? We're getting to him. This is how the book works. It's yeah. a lot of build. Another really good book that was made into a decent movie is uh, Tristram Shandy, A Cock and Bull Story. Oh, so great. I love the... Yeah, this just reminds <laughs> me of... It's the most meta thing I've ever seen. Yeah. Like, they're making an adaptation of the movie, but the movie you're watching includes the characters making the movie and the real actor playing the character, playing the person making the movie. Yeah. It's bizarre. And the book did this, too. It's nominally the stories of a guy's life, but he gets sidetracked so often that the book ends with him saying... Where did I start? Oh, that's right. I've just been born. That's the end of the book, because he never gets to the story. That's what we're doing! Yeah. But we've already it's, recommended a couple good movies for you to watch. Yeah, it's a, and it's a very cinematic book, which yeah. we'll get to later. But it, uh, it has that vibe to it. So I feel like before we actually get to the events, we need to say, just for the random person who's joining us this time, welcome! Hey! Hi! Thanks for coming! But uh, Kurt is heavily using one of his favorite concepts, which is the concept that there exists a race called the Trophosaurians <laughs> that view time non-linearly. And I know I already said that, but just in case, the whole thing will be super confusing if you don't understand that. Yeah. I want to explain what we mean, which is that while you are stuck in time in your body moving forward a second at a time, Trophosaurians see all of time, all events that have ever happened. And it turns out there's no free will. The universe is a beautiful, like, picture that is set in stone. Everything that will happen has already happened. Yeah. Your puny brain has to view it one second at a time. But most creatures, or higher creatures in the universe, just exist in this space out of time where all moments in what we could, would call time are available to them at all times. Yeah. He describes, like, watching a human life as, like, a massively long centipede with baby legs at one end and old person legs at the front. Yeah, that's so, how like, they, they see So, like, they see, see everything. Yeah. So, it's like your Dr. Manhattan or your Donnie Darko. There's also a part where he has Trelfamadorians explaining human views of the universe to other Trelfamadorians, and they say, okay, listen, we can see the world as this big, beautiful vista with all these mountains. They see it as a guy on a moving train who's strapped into it and can't turn his head looking through a tube at just one little You're bit of it at a time. Yeah, but that's yeah. how humans see the world. Doesn't that stink? We can just go look at all the mountains anytime we want, and it's great. Yeah. That's it's the, not judgmental as that, but it's... It's a great segment. Yeah, it's the bit. alien zookeeper. He'll end up in an alien zoo in the future, by the way. Yeah, it's a fun uh, book. Explaining, it's like the SeaWorld trainer explaining to the audience how humans think. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so it's kind of demeaning, <laughs> I mean, but they're friendly. 
the yeah. trial Famidorians. So because of this, Billy has this sort of altered human version of this, which is rather than existing in a something that I literally can't conceive of, so I don't know how to describe it, rather than existing outside of time, he randomly jumps around like a record skipping or a buffering web video, if you're not aware of what a record is. Um, <laughs> right. you, you, uh, he randomly skips around, so he can't change anything he's doing, but as if you were watching your life flash before your eyes in randomized order, he's sent back to times or forward to times that haven't happened yet. And he's just like, oh, my consciousness is here now. I'll observe what I do. Yeah. And then until I time travel again. And Billy is born in America. He briefly goes to the an optometry school. He's just kind of this skinny, random kid. And then he... Okay, so we're going to do it sort of chronologically, his life story? I think it might help. Yeah. Let's do that starting now. Okay, so yeah. Billy's born. But just so you know, if you haven't read the book... All of these scenes are shuffled around in different orders in order to make artistic points. Right. But we're Very just going to tell you like what his life was like were it normal. <laughs> yeah. And the out of orderness works great. It's really nice. But in yes. order to explain it's it to great you, effect, we... but it makes it impossible to explain right. in a podcast format. Yeah. So Billy is, I think he's born in Ilium, but then he goes to optometry school in Ilium, which is a town in upstate New York that is in a lot of Kurt Vonnegut things and is fictional. Then he is serving in World War II as a chaplain's assistant, which is just a fun job to me. Probably, the yeah. Army. The safest job he could get, probably. Yeah. And sounded then sounded like he was angling for something where he didn't have to carry a gun. Yeah. And then in 1944, while he's in the field, he becomes unstuck in time. He starts bouncing around throughout his whole life and having this perspective. Even before that, he was so upset with being in the war that he kept telling his, his own troops, you guys go on without me, and just like wants to be left behind. And once he's unstuck in time, he's truly useless to the unit because he can't focus on anything. He's just he goes off around. in these crazy daydreams. For So I guess I was wrong when I said he can't change what he does because he will, for example, be projected forward in time to a time when he's like having sex with a beautiful woman. We'll get there. Yeah. And... Then he'll bounce back in time to World War II and someone will be shaking him being like, why are you saying sex sounds? What? And he's just like <laughs> right. freezing in the snow. So I guess the time travel actually does affect him. Or if you're reading it the alternate way, this chaplain's assistant has been shell-shocked to the point of uselessness. He is right. a burden to his platoon. Yeah. But in his defense, he's not like, and you got to save me. He's like, I get it. I'm a burden. You guys can leave me here in the snow. It's okay. Yeah, right. He's right. like, fine with it. Yeah. <laughs> he gets trapped behind enemy lines with yeah. four other guys, Roland Weary, Paul Lazaro, and two unnamed scouts. Yeah. And he is a huge burden, knows it, says, please leave me behind. They don't because you don't leave a man behind or whatever. Ironically, the two scouts who are not named but are like, they do seem like Frank Sinatra and John Wayne. Yeah, and they're, they're good soldiers. Super capable, yeah. They realize what a burden all three of these losers are Yeah, and ditch them. Yeah. And I like Vonnegut goes out of his way to tell us that just as fate would have it, of course, this is so Vonnegut, the two very capable scouts are immediately shot in the head by like snipers from far away. Couldn't right. have avoided it, no matter how <laughs> capable you are. Whereas the losers, because they are literally like... They fall into fighting amongst themselves, like Paul Lazaro, who's an ass, huge asshole, will be yeah. one of the main villains of the book, starts beating the shit out of Billy Pilgrim just because he needs someone to blame for their predicament. He's like, you're the reason that the capable guys ditched us, you piece of shit, is punching his gut. Billy Pilgrim's like, you can leave me. I don't <laughs> care. And because they're like making a ruckus and seem so unprofessional... The German soldiers who just executed their compatriots are able to easily sneak up on them and capture them. So they actually live because they're incompetent, which I thought was a great little twist, yeah. little detail. The competent ones are shot in the head and the ones who suck, who don't even want to live, <laughs> yeah. live the rest of their lives <laughs> against their will, seemingly. Yeah. And Weary is also dragging Billy around against, kind of against Billy's wishes. He's just like, no, uh -huh. I'll keep saying, like, they're about to get shot in a road. And Weary says, move you dumb motherfucker to him. Yeah. And that snaps him out of it and saves his life again. So, and, yeah. So they, uh, just to like get through straight up like the meat and potatoes, what happens? Yeah. They take Roland Weary's shoes. So, and then they have to do this long death march. And because he didn't have shoes, he has to walk over glass and rubble through the mud for many, many miles. Yeah. They all get packed into a train car to get shipped to the prison camp where they're going to stay. Three people who die in the train car sequence. One, 
Wild Bob, who will yeah. come up again. <laughs> this old colonel who's also clearly gone crazy from the horrors of war, wandering up and down the line saying, are you from the 451st Regiment? That's my regiment. Don't worry, boys. Wild Bob's here. Everything's going to be fine. Right. It's very clear that no one from his regiment is there. He's crazy. And that no one is particularly excited about him or calls him Wild Bob right. or anything like that. We mention this because Billy Pilgrim makes it a catchphrase throughout his life, what his dying words were, which is, if you're ever in, I forget, but it's like Oklahoma or whatever. I think Cody, Wyoming. If you're ever in Cody, Wyoming, yeah. look up Wild Bob. <laughs> and Billy will go on to say that to his war buddies as like an in-joke for the rest of his life, which yeah. is a morbid in-joke because it was the guy's last words. When also, and that comes on the heels of when they're getting through the woods and the two scouts leave them and then die. Weary, in his mind, has decided that he and the two scouts are the heroes. And they are a group he calls the Three Lazaro Musketeers. I think it's Lazaro decides that. Paul Lazaro. So we're the Three Musketeers. I think, it's, I think it's Weary. You know what? Let's look it up. I call this segment, Be Right Back. Well, and we're back. I was right. It was Roland Weary. All right. He decided <laughs> they were the three musketeers. And then he blamed Billy for being separated from them because he thought the scouts only decided Billy stunk when in actuality, the whole unit stunk. But I wanted to get into them because then the three musketeers thing happens and Weary is like, I blame you for that. And then when Weary's dying of gangrene because his feet are screwed up, he's like, make sure my parents and everyone know that Billy Pilgrim killed me. Exactly. Saving yeah, him right. killed me. So, and so uh, then Lazaro is like, I know that forever and I'm going to kill Billy Pilgrim in revenge. That's what confused me is, yeah, Lazaro takes on that belief from Weary. But basically, yeah. to get us back in the moment and media res, they're in the uh, shipping container train car going to the work camp. You know, Wild Bob, he dies. He also meets a hobo who dies. <laughs> so it goes. Mm. Uh, we'll get into more detail, I think, when we're going back over the book. But to get through the basic events, as you said, Roland Weary dies in the train of gangrene because he had no boots. He blames kind of pretty unfairly, almost yeah. delusionally, Billy Pilgrim. Paul Lazaro, who just is a dick and loves having reasons to fuck with people and commit yeah. revenge. He says, if anyone asks you what the sweetest thing in the world is, it's revenge. <laughs> so he immediately jumps on it and is like, this gives my life meaning right now. I'm going to kill you, Billy Pilgrim. So yeah. he's this scary, ultra aggressive like the whole time they're in the camps at every opportunity he's beating the shit out of billy telling him he's gonna kill him telling him horrible stories about you know the worst way to execute someone describing vividly ways he's gonna murder him like and it, the kinds of things that we get emailed occasionally <laughs> here at cracked right yeah real <laughs> hate know, mail standard standard inbox stuff well and also there's an early early part in the book where kurt is writing as himself and saying that Someone told him once that he never puts villains in his books. And he said that he was taught in college that everyone's nice and everyone's the same and no one's a villain. And so that's why he doesn't do it, which is kind of a winky reason to say that. But when he's talking about two guys who are in the unit, one of them's Edgar Derby, who he says has the best body. And, and <laughs> he specifically describes him that way. And then he specifically describes Paul Lazaro as having the worst body in the unit. And I feel like he's almost saying all the reasons that Lazaro is shitty and mean to people are because it's he was born complex, with a lousy yeah. piece of equipment. And it's kind of like, like his short story, Unready to Wear, where people are getting in and out of bodies. And uh, Galapagos is another novel. There's a lot of stuff in Kurt's work about how just the bodies people are given will often motivate them being saints, sinners, everything. In yeah, between. but he is pretty villainous. To, I mean, to the point that oh, he's, he's described yeah. as... If Paul Lazaro were a dog, someone would have shot him and sent his head to a veterinary clinic to see whether he had rabies. <laughs> but he was a man, so they didn't do that. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> so they arrive, there's the sequence at the first work camp where the notable events that they are welcomed by like a singing, dancing chorus line of British soldiers yeah, who are used to counterpoint the Americans because they've been prisoners of war for a long time and they're taking it really well. Yeah. Like they get enough food, they shave every day, they keep their spirits very high, they're very cheerful and they like write and put on plays. They put on Cinderella recently. Yeah. And they are used to very violently, obviously, counterpoint the Americans who have faced more of the carnage and are sort of at the end of the prisoner of war arc. So when the Americans all shamble in, the Brits are like, we welcome yeah. you to Munchkin land. There's food over there. It's World War. Hey. Yeah, they're, they're literally <laughs> singing a song from, I think, Pirates of Penzance or something. Yeah. It's, it's like a song oh, and God dance about damn it, welcome. Alex. 
Penzance. <laughs> that one is verified. There's I no it way it's Penzance. No, it's Penzance. Pi- <laughs> the Pirates of Penzance. Yep. It's Oof Penzance. Yeah. He's the very model of a modern major general. <laughs> well, and, and the Britishers are happy because because of a clerical error at the Red Cross, they've been sent ten times as many supplies as they actually need. So, yeah, they're also incredibly lucky. So they're loaded. In terms of being they're... well off. They're like well fed and shit when they shouldn't be. Right. So the, the Brits quickly go from being like really welcoming to disgusted and describing how like, Jesus, American soldiers are like animals i can't they're all hollowed out and empty eyed yeah and just it really uh paints a good picture of the difference between how the war is faring for both groups billy is doing so poorly that he starts just like shrieking and flipping out at dinner yeah and they send him to the hospital so he's separated where paul lazaro comes in the night and tries to kill him or like says i'm gonna now is the time i'm gonna kill you yeah edgar derby stops this madness and it's at that point that he sort of takes a deep liking to Edgar Derby, who's a high school teacher who just came to fight Nazis because it seemed like the right thing to do. Yeah. And is just like a great guy. He's a really fine, upstanding person. And they becomes... always call him poor old Edgar Derby every time he's mentioned, which I yeah. love. Yeah, which is great. He's and he, doomed. And he's sort of a surrogate father for Billy in this camp where they first are. Yeah. They then, are sent from there to another camp, or does anything yeah. else happen in the camp that you want to mention now? Not in particular. I think because they, they then are sent from there to a camp in Dresden, and they're told, listen, the this money is camp. <laughs> an even better place for you to be because there's nothing of military value in the city of Dresden to the Nazis. It's a German city. So you'll be sent there. It's not a military target. So you'll just hang out in this beautiful medieval town, and then the war Working. will end. It's going like, to be great. Basically, like people who are in prison, you'll just be on a work gang. Yeah. Things could be a lot worse. Because the Geneva Conventions say you can't be making bullets and doing war work specifically, but they'll have you, like, digging and stuff. It'll be great. You'll you'll love it. And yeah. so they're all marched to that, and then they are faced with their job of... Digging up corpses will very initi- soon become right. the order of the day. But at first, they're doing some other form of digging or chopping or breaking. Yeah, their initial job is not digging up bodies, but they're also shown their air raid spot there's they're told hey we're not going to get bombed here but in case you get bombed you're going to want to go to schlachthof 5 that's german for slaughterhouse five that's your home now it's an old slaughterhouse but pretty much every animal in the continent has been eaten so it's just a spot where you'll hide out if we start getting bombed you can get underground there yeah exactly so they're at the new camp I think Vonnegut repeatedly tells us, like, a countdown, like, this is only two days from the bombing, and then finally the bombing happens. Yeah. Obviously, the bombing is actually happens at the end of the book when you're reading the book, but in the order of his life, now would be a good time for the bombing. <laughs> Everybody dies, except yeah. the people we know, they're like the main characters, because they're hiding in their slaughterhouse. They come out to the surface. It seems like the surface of the moon. It's crazy how destroyed it is. Like, I don't know how to over or how to state it, but it's real bad. They go around digging up bodies, which he calls corpse mines. It's yeah. really graphic imagery of just how much it fucking sucked. Oh, before that, their yes. job was working in a factory for syrup for pregnant women. It's like a nutritional syrup. That's right. And the, the and they start sneaking POWs it. were kind of starving, but since the syrup had all the nutrients you need, they just started feeding it to themselves. Yeah, eating baby syrup. And yeah. it was like the best thing any of them had ever tasted. Yeah, yeah. It's like when Principal Skinner gets back from Vietnam and he's like... I was a POW for six years. I subsisted on a thin gruel of meat, vegetables, rice, porridge. I tried to find it in the States, but they can never get the spices right. Because <laughs> he talks about coming back home and missing that unique thing. Yeah. Because at the time he ate it, because he was starving to death, it was the best thing he had ever tasted. Like yeah. they describe him like bursting into tears after eating it. So even as an old man, as you'd expect, he remembers that unique taste and is like, I wish I had some of that baby syrup right now. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, they are corpse miners for a while before eventually the war starts to wrap up. So the Germans all retreat, leaving them to their own devices. They go through a brief period of looting where they take a horse and cart around just robbing as much shit as they can from all the abandoned German areas before the Russians overtake them. When the Russians overtake them, everyone splits except Billy because he just can't be bothered. As usual, he just sits comatose, like, go on without me. The Russians capture him in a prisoner exchange. He is sent back home to America. End of war section. 
Back yeah. in America, he gets back to being an optometrist. Yeah, he finishes school in that. Yeah. He has a brief nervous breakdown, which no one can really explain. And then he is... Although they're like, it probably has something to do with the war. Right. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Makes sense. Think? Yeah. Right. <laughs> he gets let out of... The, I wouldn't say he gets over it, but he gets let out of the hospital for right. it. He marries Valencia Merble, who is the daughter of a wealthy mm-hmm. family in Italy. A wealthy optometrist. Yeah. <laughs> Empire. <laughs> the mightiest optometrist. Yeah. And she's described not particularly nicely. Oh, we'll say, get to that. The book. That's some of my what's or that, um, yeah. But they have two children. One of the children is named Robert, and he is all kinds of trouble throughout his youth, and then straightens out when he joins the Green Berets and goes to Vietnam. Right. So interesting counterpoint. You don't find out the details of how Vietnam affected him. Like, you never see whether he's haunted or not in the way his father was. But it's interesting that he's definitely depicted as a kid whose life was going to be a dead end, and becoming a soldier made his life work out very well yeah so it was a like, net positive well yeah. how can that be if war is so horrible right. he definitely loves throwing in counterpoints where you're like yeah yeah there's also soldiers who come back are always proud of what they did even though the killing was sad yeah and like i don't know it's just weird different things affect different people differently because <laughs> at one point robert even says ah, it's not a great war you know but right. the green berets and the military were such a good thing for him that He's happy about exactly. that. Exactly. His yeah. other kid is Barbara, who's his daughter. Oh, yeah. And uh, she will kind of be caretaking him when he's older. Because... Her only real role in the novel is to stick him in, in an old folks' home at the right. end. Yeah. <laughs> Otherwise, when... you don't know a lot about her. Yeah, because also uh, Billy, in the run-up to that, he cheats on his wife at one point and, and just mm-hmm. kind of a random drunken way at a party. He's just sort of drifting through life as an optometrist. He's also still unstuck in time at all times. So whether it's real PTSD or mystical yeah. unstuck in time, he's constantly flashing forward and backward in time. And so he, he doesn't... He seems to not care particularly about much of anything except maybe his dog, Spot. He loves his dog. <laughs> yeah, that... Yeah. In his life, he has a dog. It grows up, gets old, and dies, and he bonds with it over the course of its life. Yeah. It's more important than it sounds. It comes up a lot, actually. (laughs) Because whenever he unsticks back to his life at home, spots sort of a barometer for what year it is. (laughs) Yes, how old the dog is. And also, I think he's always pleased when he's reunited with his dog, a lot like Rumford and Kazak. Yeah. Like, any time that fate happens to reunite him with his dog, he's obviously really pleased. And He becomes a very wealthy optometrist. Yeah. Thanks to his family connections and like marrying the right woman. There's some talk about how like he didn't know if he really wanted to marry her. It was <laughs> it sounded like a Job moment. Like they describe as he's proposing to her in his brain, thinking to himself, I don't know why I would ever propose to her. Why am I doing this? Do you mean it's like, like do you mean like biblical Job or Arrested no? I mean development Arrested Job. Development yeah, yeah. where he goes, I've made a I terrible, made a terrible mistake. mistake. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it really felt like uh, Sound of Silence could have started playing while I was reading the part where he's like, and then he yeah. proposed to her while thinking, why am I proposing to this person? <laughs> right. Why haven't why? Because I always have and I always will, and that's the way the moment was structured. Is how. Uh, Trial Famidorian would say it. So he has this convenient marriage with this woman who loves him very much and seems perfectly pleasant, but it's not like a romance to end all romances. It's just fine. He has fine relationships with his kids, but not great. He seems largely distant and haunted by the war constantly. Yeah. And he he becomes a leading person in the community. There's a nice touch where Vonnegut has Billy become unstuck to giving a speech as the new president of the Lions Club in town. Yeah. And Billy in his head is like, I have a terrible voice. I have a terrible presence. I, this is going to go very right. poorly. And then the speech goes great because in this time, Billy's taken like public speaking lessons They're like, and yeah. become more confident and become put together. So and the Billy's difference was, blown away. yeah, he had forgotten in that moment that, oh, that's right. A year before this moment I'm in now, I took elocution lessons, so I'm actually a very good speaker now. Yeah. I forgot. And then he just <laughs> gives a good speech. Yeah. So, yeah, they have a lot of fun with that. One of my favorites is the one true tender moment, I think, between he and Val is they just finished having sex, I think, and he gets up just to go to the bathroom and come back. And while he's in the bathroom, he is unstuck in time, or the other way to read it is the tile in the bathroom triggers a sense memory of being in the hospital. Well, we talked about him being in the hospital at the work camp. And basically, he has one of the sickest, most upsetting scenes where Paul Lazaro comes in and like whispers all the shit he's going to like tear his guts out in front of him and shit. And he's violently ill and like living a living nightmare. Right. And then he comes out of the bathroom. Like, he gets unstuck in time back to the same time and goes back to bed with his wife, and she goes, I missed you. 
or no, it's good to see you or something. And yeah. he's like, I miss you. <laughs> and uh, it just has so much more meaning if you took it on the sci-fi value and were like, you're teleported away from your wife for what she doesn't realize is six days of torture. And then right. in the same instant, you're teleported back and you're like, I missed you. It right. has deeper meaning. So we're glossing over a lot of the great deep meaning that comes from shuffling the scenes around because we're describing yeah. it in that order. But that was one of them. Yeah, yeah. From there, <laughs> uh, his daughter Barbara is going to get married in 1967. And on the night of the party after the wedding, Billy, since he's on second time, knows he's going to be abducted by aliens. He's walking around yeah. his house. He gets like a crank call from a drunk. And he's like, well, anyway, time to go out on the lawn and get abducted. And he's beamed up by a spaceship from Tralfamador and deposited in their zoo, their alien zoo. And he's alone in the exhibit. And they say, yeah, we're working on someone for you to mate with. We're so excited about it. In the meantime... Like a panda. He's basically yeah. in an enclosure <laughs> like we would watch pandas and be happy when they mated. Yeah. So they yeah. get a woman for him. Yeah. And they then, want them to produce offspring. And before that, they're like, by the way, there's no such thing as free will. Earthlings are the only people who care about it. Also, this is how time works and all these different things. And uh, anyway, now that we've told you that, here's your mate. Her name is Montana Wildhack. She's a gorgeous movie starlet from... From Earth. your time period. Yeah. yeah. They... Again, in the classic Kurt Vonnegut way that I don't care for. She goes from being terrified, naturally, because she's in space being told she's about to be raped by this dude. Yeah. To, in a very short time, being very openly sexual with him and wanting his seed. Right. Um, and, and they become a successful tourist attraction on Trail Famador. Everyone loves watching them fuck. Right. And uh, <laughs> when she finally gets pregnant, it's a big cause for celebration, just like it would be when, like, Ling Ling at the zoo has a panda baby. Oh, zoo babies are the best. Zoo it's babies. It's just really exciting. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, but in his terrestrial life that now sort of happens simultaneously, yeah. it's weird because he will teleport in time to an unspecified time and be on the zoo in the zoo area but also you know that his yeah. life ends with him making a speech in Ilium when, uh, as an old man explaining to people how Tralfamador's views time and yeah. everyone applauding and going like oh great thanks for like a good TED talk he <laughs> dies on stage while delivering a good TED talk so somehow I guess he's let well, out I, of the zoo later I, if I've got it right what I believe happens is after they have a baby they're like great good job and he's sent back to earth and continues his life on earth and then he gets in a plane crash when he's on the way to an although there's no conference. reference made to any other character in the book being like do you remember that six month period where he was gone and no one right. could find him his disappearance is not remarked on yeah all. yeah so so it's a little bit another fuzzy. one in the PTSD column, maybe. Yeah, including like, there's a all... yeah a lot of the clues like well we'll get there when we get to the pornography store. <laughs> <laughs> it's a pornography store. I was buying pornography. <laughs> Sorry, another Simpsons it's knee great. jerk. Yeah, yeah. Um, but you were saying where where are we now? Oh, the plane crash. Yeah, That's right. So he's on a plane with a bunch of other optometrists, including Valencia's father, to go to an optometrist conference in Montreal. The, the optometry world comes up all the a time lot. in this. Like in Welcome to the Monkey House, when there's a lot of aluminum store window right. sales. Going to say the most. Going to be a lot of selling eyeglass frames. So the the plane crash. The plane happens. crashes, everyone dies except the co-pilot and Billy. Right. And, and then, that's just as luck would have it. Yeah, and Billy is sent to a hospital to heal from his injuries. His wife, Valencia, freaks out and when tries to When she hears drive. he's been hospitalized. Yeah, yeah, tries to drive there as quickly as she can. She gets into a car accident that screws up her car's exhaust system. So then she, I think very brutally, dies of brutally. trying to drive the rest of the way to the hospital. The exhaust is going into the car and she dies of carbon monoxide. Right. She pulls up in front of the hospital... And immediately dies. And yeah. they literally like a Looney Tunes cartoon where they come out with the stretcher and are like, <laughs> yeah. hop, 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 oh, she's dead. <laughs> and right, take right. her in. Like, <laughs> and uh, so then Billy, of course, comes out of his plane crash coma and his daughter has to tell him, also mom died right. while and, you're in the coma. And so then Billy's pretty much homebound from there. His daughter is just taking care of him. His son she is She wants him to live with them. He's a stubborn old person who says, yeah. no, I just want to live alone in this giant house with my dog and be lonely and die. Yeah. And then, <laughs> and then from being alone and sad in his house, he immediately has kind of a fit of mania and starts telling everyone he can about Tralfamador and how time works and the he world. He starts telling the whole zoo story, writing letters to publishers, trying to get on TV shows to be interviewed, because he really wants to explain to people how time works, because he thinks it will make death much less sad and war yeah. much less sad. Because if you realize that... People who are dead are just dead at that point in time, and at plenty of other points in time, they're doing perfectly all right. It's great, because it makes you reconceptualize this concept that Vonnegut's used a lot, which is, what if time is an illusion? As 
a coping mechanism that a someone who suffered tremendous trauma might use. Yeah. So it's like the idea that time marches on and everyone will eventually die alone in darkness and have to n- not know what is going to happen next is so sad and scary. And he saw it happen to so many of his friends and strangers in such brutal fashion that he has decided to believe that no, no matter how brutal your death, it's just a thing in time. It was always going to happen. Don't feel bad that it happened. You're also still alive as a baby. Everything's fine. So it's either true in a sci-fi sense, which I thought was really interesting about the movie. The movie makes it much more explicitly sci-fi. For example, one of the few changes they make in the book when he's on the plane where everyone's going to crash, he does what Dr. Manhattan does. He silently sits in the plane knowing it's going to crash, but he doesn't alter his behavior or try to prevent the crash in any way right. because the plane crashes and there's nothing to be done about it. In the movie, they have him run up to the pilot and go like, this plane's going to crash. I saw it like a vision, which is to me kind of crazy because that makes it explicitly sci-fi. It's a big Boy. offer if you think about it deeply, whereas in the book, it's very much like could be sci-fi, might not be. Well, I feel like you could also take the movie version as it's just a crazy PTSD episode. Like he's just afraid of this fight right. for some. But the form his PTSD takes is he believes in Tralfamador and all this nonsense. Yeah. So uh, I think the rest of his life story wraps up fairly quickly. Yeah, it's not super clear, but it's kind of implied. He that gets on a radio he show. Spends the, he goes on a radio show and then spends his remaining years telling everyone he can about it and doing speeches places. And then at a well-attended speech at the end of his, uh, I think it's 1976. Which seems like it may or may not have really happened like if you're yeah. believing in the ptsd angle this is probably a pleasant delusion of what his future will be because it uses a lot of dream logic at this speech he says i'm going to die within an hour or so it's been foretold and if you're sad about that you don't understand what i've been telling you that death is just a violet light and a hum and our lives are determined and they just happen and, and you you're don't free to, to come be... back to the part of the movie where you're alive anytime you want yeah like yeah, after yeah. you transcend time you're able to bounce around yeah so like don't cry for me argentina and <laughs> yeah. uh and then it's heavily implied that he gets assassinated by paul lazaro which I, again, think is really compelling dream logic or evidence that it's his brain is fabricating this. Because, A, why would he yeah. be giving a well-attended TED Talk where everyone believes the crazy nonsense, he says? <laughs> and, B, it's kind of stretches credulity. Because they show in the middle part of the war that Paul Lazaro, like, hates everyone and goes in and out of, like, I'm going to murder you. And then the next day he'll be like, I don't remember your name. I don't give a shit. It's hard to believe that he really would. 50 years later hunt down and assassinate this guy right but because he's lived his whole life with those memories of that scary dude promising he would kill him he assumes that's how he'll die and i think he says in the speech there's a man named paul lazaro who told me he would kill me like 45 years ago right he is insane today he will keep his promise but don't be sad and that's the end of his imagined life i think the only thing we skipped is the big scene that really tipped for me that the PTSD angle, which is that he stops at a pornography store because he sees Kilgore Trout novels in the window. Yeah. So he stops to check out the sci-fi, but while he's in there, he sees two things. He sees a picture of a woman having sex with a Shetland pony, Mm -hmm. which comes up again in one of his unstuck in time sequences. He sees the exact same. Oh no. There's a really, his son, Robert is masturbating to the exact same image or something. Yeah. And also one of the, I think it was, it was either weary or Lazaro. Now I forget, but one of them had that picture, had that picture. And then there's three times in the book where there's a picture of a a pony having sex with a human woman. And I kept hoping there would be a Vonnegut doodle of that, but there isn't. (laughs) And then (laughs) Matthew Abel, Vaughn, a friend, yeah. Uh, who does doodles please doodle i don't know i want to see no i uh, want to see a doodle of the three musketeers crowding around looking at the photo of the woman fine. having sex let's with get the pony. that yeah that, that way the great. pony penis detail will be very, very small yeah I can be, right. yeah. yeah yeah anyway <laughs> in the pornography store he also happens to see a magazine where the cover story is montana wild hack the woman from the space zoo yeah being really sexy and the cover story, it's like a National Enquirer type thing. And it's about how she mysteriously disappeared and there's conspiracy theories about what happened to her. So, obvious big offer, if you want to believe that the zoo stuff is all made up stuff from his mind, from his PTSD shattered mind, these are where he got the building blocks, right? right? That's the picture of Montana Wildhack that made him think, that's the woman that the aliens brought to me. 
Yeah. And he tricks himself, if you're believing that it's all in his head, by reversing the events. Like in his mind, he's like, oh, how interesting that I see this magazine. And coincidentally, in the zoo, she's the lady that I'm fucking. But it's like, yeah. that could easily be the other order. And then it would obviously seem like a dream or an illusion. Yeah. If you just reverse the order. And his reading Trout novels would explain where he got the planet and all that. Because he's not a sci-fi writer or even He even a says he reads a Trout person. novel, the premise of which is a guy gets kidnapped to an alien zoo right so like if you're familiar with the tim robbins movie jacob's ladder it's another nope. like nah it's just a good like are demons coming down from the heavens to torment this guy oh i think it's just ptsd oh. made into a, a visual symbology i oh, uh, or a little more tangentially it's like that theory about the movie signs where they think they're aliens but actually it's demons you know i never thought about it that way yeah so like his faith comes back because he's seeing s proof of hell basically yeah like, like they, they, they're coming from below and it's yeah so yeah i think that might be plot time yeah i think cool let's do another segment because it'll get us back to maybe favorite bits of the story mm -hmm. called kurt blurt uh, 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 <laughs> oh the room is full of blurts now. We just felt <laughs> into the space. Uh, I was inhaling. There's no room. I'm sucking your blurts right out of the air. Well, because the I think the famous Kurt blurt from across the book that also it, it sort of sums up the Tralfamadorian viewpoint is so it goes. And if you've never read Kurt, if you only know of him tangentially through other people liking him, you've probably heard the phrase so it goes. I actually thought it was overused in this. Like, I'm yeah. sick of hearing so it goes well, now. It, it, so it goes became like the hey ya of this book. I was like, <laughs> so it goes is, has a really fresh hook, but I don't need to read it a million times. Right. I don't he, need to hear yeah. it at every dance from the year 2000 to 2006. Yeah. And the phrase and so on. He uses both ad yeah. nauseum in this. And he says that so it goes, basically the origin of it in this universe, is that that's what the Tralfamadorians say when they learn that someone has died. Or I guess from their point of view when they choose to look at the point in someone's life where they are dead, yeah. they go, oh, so it goes. And like, well, they have the interesting language things, like their greeting is hello, farewell, because time yeah. doesn't matter. And so the way you say, so, oh, that guy's dead is so it goes. So I believe it pans out that like every time a death is ever mentioned, anyone or any animal dies in the book. Right. He feels compelled to say so it goes, including to the point where they're like, they were riding around in this cart the cart's axles were greased with the fat of rent with the rendered fat of dead animals. So it goes. Yeah. <laughs> so or it's like, like literally soap. like a rest in peace. <laughs> I, I think there's also soap made out of concentration camp victims. And so just, it goes. Yeah, so it goes. Yeah. And it's like a catchphrase that means like, you know, death. Because <laughs> <laughs> there's a mental floss. I don't know if they did the count or got it somewhere, but they did a count. And apparently it comes up 106 times in the book. And my copy of the book is 215 pages. So on average, every other page, it says so it goes. That it's is quite a bit. Impressive. Yeah. yeah. And there are times when the so it goes is really impactful. There were a lot of times that I was like, I think the sentence was really great without the so it goes added. Yeah. I don't and, know why I'm shitting on So It Goes, but... <laughs> and I think it's particular because I was rereading it this time, and I think on the reread, it's less impactful because, you know, it's throughout the book and you've already heard it. Right. So you're hearing it for the 300th, 400th time. Yes, you know? it's, it's true. Like, okay. All right. Well, speaking of which, you also brought up Pootie Wheat. Yes. Is used to end multiple Kurt Vonnegut novels. That is yeah. the last... And I would love your take on it because it's one of the few... Things that I'm just so dense. I don't understand why he ended several novels with it. So it must mean something. Yeah. Why? I. What does it mean for the novel to end with? And the birds went pooty tweet. <laughs> well, it, why? If you haven't heard those uh, in Cat's Cradle, the world ends, and then the last thing they hear, it, they notice, is a bird saying pooty wheat. And then in God Bless You, Mister Rosewater, Elliot imagines the city of Indianapolis being firebombed like Dresden blacks out, wakes up in an institution, and the first thing he notices is a bird saying, Pooty Wheat. And then this book ends after the massacre with Pooty Wheat. And I think it is a representation. I just want people to know you're shrugging every time you say Pooty Wheat. It's as great. if I'm trying to make that birds little, are asking something you know, when you they know do that. You know that little text icon of a, of a guy being like, whatever. Pooty Wheat? Do the shrug. Yeah, yeah. I'm trying to do that. I think it's a literalization of someone being so 
broken by the disasters of the world that they start noticing the things around them. Like they're not wrapped up anymore in the day to day of like trying to think and like So and, it's the idea of like finally there's enough silence that you'd actually notice the bird sounds, which you don't usually think about. Yeah, and and not just silence from everything having been killed, but also just mental clarity. Like I've been working on meditating more this past year or two. And when I'm doing it, I suddenly start to notice that there's background noises that I just never pick out. And I think okay. it's that kind of I thing where that, putty weed is the background noise that you aren't noticing because you're too busy not having clarity about the world. So I you could have equally said like, blah, 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 blah. The sun was also there. Like, it's yeah. like, oh, yeah, you're yeah. now noticing the world in the present tense or whatever. Yeah. I, I think, like that. I think he just likes the onomatopoeia. It's of a the, weird onomatopoeia. That's what throws me is I'm like, cry. why do you like the pooty wheat so much? It's such a weird sequence yeah. of sounds. I think I think because Kurt's a funny person. He wanted <laughs> sure, the noise that you noticed to be that instead of like fans pooty or something. It's a funny you know? sound. Pooty right. wheat. Yeah. I like it. <laughs> instead of like cars went by, you know, mm. like it's like fun. But yeah, and it, as far as I know, this is also the last significant time he uses it. So we we can get into it. But I feel like a lot of his novels are sort of dry runs at this one. And so he kind of workshops. the wettest run there is. <laughs> Sopping run. Yeah. <laughs> so he kind of workshopped his bird noise symbolism in that process. <laughs> That was his of greatest. Getting wet. Yeah, his greatest skill was yeah. he finally found what he thinks birds say in written form. <laughs> Uh, it's funny you say that's the main quote, or so it goes. I guess it is. But I always thought the quote everyone knew from this book was, Go take a flying fuck at a rolling donut, <laughs> murmured Paul Lazaro. Go take a flying fuck at the moon. <laughs> yeah. Well, so it goes the famous one, but there are so many other distinctive awesome ones oh, like that. that I think. I, yeah. yeah. I just know the Kurt Vonnegut Twitter feed, which only tweets Kurt Vonnegut quotes and does a pretty good job curating excellent ones. Yeah, it really They does. retweet that one maybe once a week. Yeah, Whoever's over there is endlessly tickled, as they yeah. should be, and by Kurt, the idea of someone trying to thrust so hard that their penis goes to the moon. It's funny. <laughs> <laughs> and, I th and I think Gert's tickled by it because at least once in the rest of his work, he reuses it. And it's an essay talking about yeah. how he feels about the University of Chicago for not giving him a master's degree until after he didn't need it. <laughs> he says they can take a flying fucking rolling donut. At a rolling donut, donut. yeah. The moon. I feel like I'd want just like a raspberry jelly donut microwaved for three to five seconds because then it's a little warm mm, and you've already yeah. got the hole there <laughs> why Moving does it need on? to be raspberry why <laughs> does the flavor matter oh, you i'm into some really <laughs> dark dark stuff <laughs> bad image there's one in the first chapter and again the first and last chapter where he's speaking as himself or great like it's not it's not a waste of time at all but there's one part where he's talking about he works his trip to go visit bernard o'hare at home into a trip to take his daughter to the world's fair and they're on the river and they're just looking at that and experiencing it and he's thinking about his life and about how he's trying to turn parts of it into a book and he says and i asked myself about the present how wide it was how deep it was how much was mine to keep i think it's a really nice. it's a really wonderful line about being present in the moment and also what you do with those moments as you gather them. You know? Absolutely. My first like five are actually from that opening chapter. So, I mean, you're right. The preface is incredible, but yeah. I just thought this was really ahead of its time in terms of being a thing that everyone mentions now, but this is the first like drunk dialing joke I'm aware of in literature. <laughs> he says, I have this disease late at night sometimes involving alcohol in the telephone. Mm. And I was just like, oh, that's a proto joke about drunk dialing. That's like the first drunk dial joke, I think, that I've seen or heard of in <laughs> literature. And you were talking earlier in the same part he talks about, or you were talking about how he never writes villains because he was taught that, they're, that they don't really exist. Yeah. And uh, he actually says, I thought the wording was great. I forget what school he's at, but at that time, they were still teaching that there was absolutely no difference between anybody. They may be teaching that still. Another thing they taught was that nobody was ridiculous or bad or disgusting. Yeah. I really like that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> One of his great skills to me is to view things that everyone's viewed before, but with fresh eyes. He's really good at looking things, looking at things like how an alien would look at them. Yeah. And just going like... Describing it very dryly in a way where you go, oh, yeah, shampoo is weird. <laughs> By, you know, through his description. You know what I'm saying. Yeah. Give me one. There's one part where he's talking about Billy Pilgrim's mother and how she tried to relate to him and how there, there would be kind of be a disconnect. Like she put a crucifix on Billy's wall and he didn't want it. But Kurt's talking about where Billy got it. And she got it while being a tourist. And he says, 
Like so many Americans, she was trying to construct a life that made sense from things she found in gift shops. Burn, America. <laughs> yeah, I had that one, so I don't have to do that yeah. one. Awesome, yeah. Like, and I, I, I mainly think it's beautifully written and only about certain people. Like, right. like I don't think he's saying every person in America no, 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 is no. trite or something, but it's it's a good encapsulation of her. Of a personality type that definitely exists, yeah. yeah. The most impactful use of and so on for me was... When he talks about a brief time he was a journalist and they had him call to interview a woman whose husband had just died and he found out on the phone call that she didn't know yet that the husband was dead and his editor immediately was like, oh, amazing, good opportunity. Tell her her husband died so you can get her honest, raw reaction. Yeah. And it's so interesting because anyone who projects himself into that situation is like, what? I'm not going to do that. But he doesn't hesitate and does it and it's because he says, I've done way worse stuff than that in the war. Yeah. Like, it's just showing how jaded he is. But the way they phrase it is, the guy tells him, oh, tell her and get her reaction. And the line is, so I did. She said about what you would expect her to say. There was a baby and so on. And I'm like, that's devastating. Right. <laughs> it's a perfect Hitchcock reveal no details. And it's way more devastating off camera, so to speak, than it would have been if it was like, she sobbed bitterly into the phone and I hung up with tears in my eyes. Yeah. You know, she said what you would expect her to say. There was a baby and so on. Right. It's like, it's just nothing ooh, to be done. Rough. Yeah. <laughs> With grief, there's one part where he makes kind of a weird point of Billy and Valencia's bed having a function in it called magic fingers, where it <laughs> vibrates and it massages you. And there's one part where Dude, he loves brand names. Yeah, that's I've, true. Yeah, I've noticed this in this whole podcast. Three Musketeers, always capitalized, Mounds Bar, Magic yeah. Fingers. He loves like bowing down to brand <laughs> names and being like Band-Aid yeah. brand band-aids were put all over their wounds. <laughs> yeah, that and aspirin. He's like, oh, Loves I love aspirin. it. Yeah. But he, he's talking about Billy is home and his daughter and his wife are out getting wedding stuff and he's feeling very depressed and very sad. And he goes upstairs and just lays in bed and there's just a brief quote where he's really turned on the magic fingers. And then Kurt says, quote, he was jiggled as he wept. <laughs> Which is just an amazing bit of comedy to me. I don't know. Oh, there's really some great. funny <laughs> bits in this. Yeah. I love his wife asks, why are you called Billy Pilgrim instead of William Pilgrim? And he says, business reasons. <laughs> That's funny because it has no explanation. But also, there's an obvious answer. It's because who wants to be called William Pilgrim? It yeah, rhymes. Weird. It sounds awful. It's, a it's weird, just a yeah. bad name. <laughs> Billy Pilgrim's much better than William Pilgrim. Yeah. <laughs> My dad's favorite quote that he used to say to oh. my brother and I as kids all the time is, the gun made a ripping sound like the opening of the zipper on the fly of God Almighty. Oh, that's fantastic. He always said that. He loves stuff with that structure, and he would also always quote to us the Lovecraft quote. It was as evil or hateful, I forget exactly the wording, but as the slime that clings to the walls of hell. <laughs> oh, that's great. So those two. Love you, Papa. <laughs> But yeah, from Slaughterhouse Five, describing a gunshot as God unzipping his fly That's is great. Because I also realized the second level this time reading through it as an adult is when you hear a gunshot, there's a good chance God's about to fuck you. Right. <laughs> That's like a great <laughs> double entendre. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, it even, it even kind of plays up the way that war can cause PTSD. Like totally. the explosions matter. You know, they affect you. We went to the New York World's Fair, saw what the past had been like according to the Ford Motor Car Company and Walt Disney, and saw what the future would be like according to General Motors. Yeah. <sighs> Burn again, America. <laughs> there's also, oh, there's. Suck a... that corporate dick, you robots. <laughs> it could be a teat. It, it doesn't have to be a dick. Suck that corporate teat. It's a teat. There's a really teat. -teat. <laughs> there's a a very I thought positively haunting moment where they're in the train car being transported as prisoners and foods being distributed. And yep. Kurt's quote is: "When food came in, the human beings were quiet and trustful and beautiful. They shared." Oh, I thought you were going to say my favorite one from that same paragraph, which oh, is describing how they. The only opening are these air ventilation things in the corner of the train cars. Right. And all the business is done through there. And he says the train car was like a giant breathing organism. Its orifices were these holes at the corners. In went water and loaves of bread and sausage and cheese. And out came shit and piss and human language. Yeah. <laughs> That's just awesome <laughs> to me. Yeah. Really good organisming. Really good. Like, yeah. Yeah. And in the same way, it reminds me a lot of Hemingway is good at this too. Just describing shit 
in a way where you're like, yeah, that's a thing I've seen before. You're describing it as if I'm an alien and it's more impactful for that reason. Yeah. So like, imagine how much less impactful this sentence would be if it was, he lifted up his big combat boot and got ready to kick Billy Pilgrim in the spine, breaking his spine. Instead, he says... Inches from the tips of Weary's boots were the pitiful buttons of Billy's spine. Weary drew back his right boot, aimed a kick at the spine, at that tube which had so many of Billy's important wires inside it. Weary was going to break the tube. Yeah. That's so much better than like, yeah. Billy was worried about being paralyzed right. <laughs> or whatever <laughs> you might write. Right, just some Clancy like, and he was an inch from being paralyzed. Yeah. Like it's, yeah. Go, There's go, go. one when Kilgore Trout, they end up meeting Kilgore Trout later in the book, which is promised by Vonnegut because he just tells you. Trout is surprised to have such a huge fan. And he says, all these years I've been opening the window and making love to the world. Yeah, I think anyone who writes work that is not read has to appreciate that metaphor. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah, or even just work that you don't do as a live performance, you know, because sure, even yeah. you can be told, oh, we sold a billion books, right, but right. that doesn't feel tangible, you know? Yeah, in the same way, one I liked was uh, when they're at the prison camp, light leaped out through the door, escaped from prison at 186,000 miles a second. Oh, uh, no, yeah. I feel like as a twin to the one you just read, where it's like, it doesn't deepen meaning that we need to analyze. It's just what a cool new way to describe something. You know, what a clever new image <laughs> that you slammed out there. There's also a, when they're being shown the Slaughterhouse Five and shown this is your air raid thing, a German officer is making them learn how to translate Schlachthof Fünf into Slaughterhouse Five. And there's one little bit where he's saying Schlacht means slaughter and Hoff yeah. means house. And then the quote I like is, Fünf was good old five. I love that one too. Really, yeah. really just friendly so way to be like, and familiar. I, ah. I don't know how he knew that adding that would add so much to that sentence. Because I don't know exactly why it works, but it's so awesome. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's kind of a joke about like on some level, your brain is like, okay, five. I got that. I know okay, that. Great. That's comforting. Got it. Got yeah, it. Which we're all yeah. kind of dumb in a fun way. And that works. The way the uh, Trout Famidorians describe the way they view time to him initially is very beautiful. Yeah. Uh, he says, you know how bugs get stuck in amber? And he goes, oh, yeah. Yeah, I saw Jurassic Park. He doesn't say that, but you know what I mean. <laughs> and they say, the quote is, quote begins, well, here we are, Mr. Pilgrim, trapped in the amber of this moment. There is no why. Which I love. Yeah. And it's also, uh, you paraphrased earlier, but in that same section, they basically say, you know, what's interesting about free will that phrase has only ever been invented by humans, and we're in contact with hundreds of sentient life forms. You guys yeah. are the only people who worry about whether the things that happen to you are your choice or not. No one else worries about that. Yeah. Which is also such a weird thing to think about, because it's so instinctual to want to know if there's free will. I don't know. When, I, there's yeah. a lot of books on this topic, and I can always trip myself up in a great like stoner way by being like, try to imagine free will not even being a concept. Yeah. Or try to imagine just not worrying about it, because whether it exists or not, you'll never know whether you have free will. Right. So There's why no do we to... worry about it so much? It's weird. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. why does it matter if the result's the same? Why does it matter if there was some spiritual eye inside me that did it? Or if it's just a movie I'm watching and that's what my body did. What's the difference? Right. My my life to me is qualitatively the same. Yeah, there's no way to tangibly know. There's no way to act differently, if that's true. Yeah. You know? And yet somehow, as a human, I find it weirdly depressing to imagine that my actions are not my free choice. Yeah. Even though there's, I don't lose anything, really, if they aren't. Right. Substantially nothing gets affected. Yeah. yeah. Which I think they illustrate really well when the Trial Famidorians say... He asks, like, what's the furthest in the future you can see out of curiosity? And they're like, well, to the universe getting destroyed, because that's the edge of the picture, so to speak, or whatever. Right. And they're like, how's the universe get destroyed? And they're like, we destroy it by accident. Yeah. <laughs> We're testing some rocket fuel, and it ends up igniting all the antimatter in the universe or whatever. Like, it, the universe just blinks out of existence. And he's like, oh, shit, what can we do about that? And they're like, what do you mean? Yeah, I mean, it's just how it works. Yeah. <laughs> it has yeah, always right. been true that that's how the universe ends. What do you mean? What are we supposed to do? And they actually say, well, what we try to do is not spend a lot of time looking at that moment because it's a pretty sad moment. We spend lots of time living in and looking at the moments we enjoyed about our lives. It's hard to talk in this way about the mosaic <laughs> we're looking at that we describe as existence. We yeah. just look at the tiles that we enjoy. And uh, I think that's also one of the central themes of the book is, as he says in the intro, no one should look back, or at least it's your choice to. 
And he says something I, that really haunted me in the beginning is, one of the weirdest things is when I think about how useless all my memories of Dresden have been. Yeah. Like how in my life, I wouldn't have done things drastically different if I hadn't witnessed that horror. So it almost seems like, why did I have to? Or like, you know, if you witness 100,000 people burn to death, you feel like there should be some point, like in Signs, or there should be some Shyamalan payoff in the movie of your life where that memory was, there was a reason you had to live through that because it gives you the strength for this moment or whatever. And he makes the very devastating point, I think, that no, you just so happen to have to live through that. Yeah. Like I, Michael Swaim, probably am now too old to go to war, so... I just so happen to not have to see the horrors of war. And I probably right. never will. It just worked out. Lucky me. Like, and, but he didn't. He had to see that. And he's saying that didn't make him better. And he doesn't know why he had to go through that. It just happened. Yeah. Well, there was a, there was a later edition of the book where he wrote an extra preface. And he in it says a particularly devastating thing about it where he says that, you know, I realized that the only person on earth who benefited from the firebombing of Dresden was me. And also, if you calculate it out, book, you if mean, you calculate it out, I made about two or three bucks on these books for every person for each killed. person that died. Yeah, of course he would do math like I guess that because he's self-loathing. Right, <laughs> that's so depressing way to look at it. Yeah. Kurt, poor Kurt, poor but old it, Kurt. And also with the with the Trail from Midorian perspective, I'm realizing that I really like symbolically that we really only see them operating a zoo and visiting a zoo because that's sort of how they're seeing their entire lives. Like they're just yeah. going to the exhibit where I was born and the exhibit where I died in the exhibit where I met my, you know, alien wife. Because of their perspective, they're just tourists all the time, sort of. They're just sort totally. of wandering around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And also, one of my favorite things in the book is that I think he celebrates both viewpoints in a lot of ways, because he he not only picks out all these things about how the Trelfamadorians can understand death and they can understand and be calm with it and cool with it. And there's one blurt here where he's talking about how they see the stars in the universe and the way he puts it as rarefied luminous spaghetti because of how the way see, they see things. Right. They see all of the movement at once. That they it will see ever all make. Of the moving around. They see its entire orbit yeah. or the entire motion it will take through the universe for its entire existence. Yeah. So they all look like lines yeah, instead yeah. of dots. But then also you think, oh, okay, so he's just saying we're dummies who are looking through a tube on a train and the aliens are brilliant. But also there's one bit where the aliens are explaining the free will thing and they also say that Earthlings are the universe's great explainers. Like they're really good at it. And I feel like Kurt is implying that because we have such a fixed perspective and because we think we have free will, then we need to figure out why everything happened. Well, yeah, We're trained to like, we need cause we and effect for everything. We invented the concept of cause and effect because yeah. it's the only way to explain what we perceive. And we perceive an illusion from the point of view of the Tralfamadorians, yeah. which is that time moves in sequence. Because of this mental disability we have, yeah. we have to invent a thing called cause and effect. So they're just like mildly impressed by this complex cause and effect system we've created that they are able to see plays no part in anything. Right. But they're impressed by how complex and how well it seems to hang together yeah, to yeah. us. They're like, you did a good job adapting to your disability. <laughs> yeah. It's like when we're like, wow, dolphins, great job echolocating. I mean, right. you could just invent radar or get a camera or something. But, but good job doing that crazy echolocating you do. And it's really beautiful. Good job. You just made it hit home for me. The book is about, right? Yeah. Suffering indescribable horror and adapting anyway. Yeah. And when the horror is so extreme... You might have to adapt in such an extreme way as to desynchronize yourself from time. Yeah. Like, like the war <laughs> is so horrible, he decided he doesn't want to be in this time stream with cause and effect anymore because the effects are usually unpleasant. Interesting way to it, look at the whole book. Yeah, and, and, and a lot of, and I forget which other novel, but Kurt says that he celebrates aspirin because it works. I think it's Cat's Cradle. Right. And, uh, Mother Night also. Yeah. And it's, so it's sort of, Unstucking in time is another one of those things. Like, it just works. You're, yeah, you're broken and it works. Hey, but it definitely it has both viewpoints because, on the surface, almost everything seems to be driving home the horror of war. Yeah, but I would say there are books I have read where all they have under their skin is really good arguments against war. I would say this book throws a couple bones to continue the skin skeleton metaphor to hawks, so to speak, or like yeah. There are several very lucid explanations of why war is necessary, if not good. Yeah. And even Billy explicitly, like B.C. Rumford, who feels 
Obviously, you can tell, even though he'll never admit it, he's defensive because of the implication that he should feel guilty about all the deaths. So he's very defensive and over the top about like, you can't feel bad about those deaths, Billy. American soldiers died too. Don't forget, we had to kill the Nazis. And I at least sense it comes from a place of, you know, he doesn't want to accept what Billy's accepted, which is any complicitness in this. He's found a way to be comfortable with it. Right. And yeah, it's just interesting to see different displays of coping mechanisms and the protagonist billy who's seen all the horrors of war says back to him oh i'm not mad that people died it's all right with me and the author says it was all right with billy pretty much everything was all right with billy and it could be a way to tip like his brain is mush now but i also think it's supposed to make you meditate on like well you need sometimes to fight a war and someone has to live through the experience of fighting it yeah i don't know i don't know i go around in circles or at, or at least that you can relieve yourself from feeling pressure about the fault of it, just because it's such a, so many, it's busy, busy, busy. You know, it's so many right. different people and things moving around. And if cause and it. effect is an illusion, so is fault. And if there's no free will, right? Like, yeah. that's another thing I often think is, like you're saying, who started World War II? Well, who started World War One? Well, who started right. it's the, the concept of like enmity between humans? Yeah, Everything's like that. Like everything in life. Yeah. <laughs> so it's so weird to me that, especially in our penal system, we're so uh, interested in assigning fault. And yeah. when you find out a major tragedy happened, like in the news or in your personal life, assigning fault seems really important, even though everyone knows and we often say assigning fault doesn't change anything. And getting vengeance doesn't bring that person back from the dead if you're getting vengeance for a death. Right. It's just a weird Life is weird. Uh, I got yeah. a few more blurts. Yeah, I think I just have one more, and that's not one I'm going to read. All right. Let me, then let me blast through yeah. some. Yeah. Because now that we've talked about how war is good sometimes, <laughs> <laughs> I want to showcase some of the best. Ooh, that makes war seem so awful, though. Right. On the ninth day, the hobo died. This is the hobo that he meets in the train car. Yeah. And uh, FYI, this hobo's only character trait is they constantly are talking about how they've been a bum all over the world in all kinds of weather. Yeah. And this concentration camp experience ain't so bad. They're like, keep your chin up. This ain't so bad. I had to walk <laughs> uphill both ways in the snow to the incinerator where I lived, you know. So the line is, on the ninth day, the hobo died. So it goes. His last words were, you think this is bad? This ain't bad. <laughs> <laughs> like that those would be the things you say before you die is great. Yeah. I think we can all relate to this. It took me back to a very particular point in my life. Billy coughed when the door was opened, and when he coughed, he shit thin gruel. This was in accordance with the third law of motion, according to Sir Isaac Newton. The law tells us that for every action, there is a reaction which is equal and opposite in direction. This can be useful in rocketry. <laughs> <laughs> So, like, weird way to describe someone shitting themselves as if an alien were describing it. Yeah. Also invites you to imagine someone shitting themselves so hard that they rock it up into the air, which I enjoyed. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> when they talk about the impregnation of Val, his wife, the way he describes her becoming pregnant is, in a tiny cavity in her great body, she began assembling the materials for a green beret. Yeah, yeah, So yeah. fucking cool. So, really cool. So much better than she got pregnant. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, because you're the master when it comes to all the Kurt cameos, and I know we'll get there. I'm not trying to trigger the theme song. Yeah, yeah. But I wanted to point out, Kurt has several cameos in this, and my favorite one is the first time you realize he's in it. The welcome feast had made them all as sick as volcanoes. Also great simile, by the way, as sick as volcanoes. Yeah, right. The buckets were full or had been kicked over. An American near Billy wailed that he had excreted everything but his brains. Moments later, he said, there they go. There they go. (laughs) He meant his brains. That was me. That was the author of this book. Yeah. (laughs) It's like pausing in the middle of a movie to see like, see that guy puking in the background? That was me. I'm in that. So yeah, it's so (laughs) awesome to me that he invented Billy Pilgrim to live through the firebombing of Dresden. Yet Billy Pilgrim in passing several times sees Kurt Vonnegut. Yeah. Who is living the same life experience, but presumably just having different thoughts about it, I guess. Yeah. And occasionally just making funny statements about it. Like they're coming up to Dresden for the first time in the train and they see how beautiful it is. And somebody just goes, Oz. And that was Kurt. It was, it's, he just makes it Kurt like saying, oh, it's like Oz. Anyway. (laughs) All right. My top three blurts and I'm out. Number three. 
And I'll go with the two silly ones first and end with a downer. It was only a little after 8 o'clock, so all the shows were about silliness or murder. Describing trying to find something to watch on TV, it's just incredible to me that that's still true. Like, that's weird that something as specific as programming from that long ago. Yes, at prime time in the evening, you will either have sitcoms or procedural drama about murder. Yeah. That's true. That's still true. That's weird. (laughs) And then... uh, (laughs) Or I guess reality now is the only like new genre of TV, primetime TV we yeah. invented. And then uh, in the book, at one point, a series of authors are describing what the function of the novel is in modern day society. And they all give pretty funny answers, such as to provide touches of color in an otherwise white room or to describe <laughs> blowjobs artistically or <laughs> to teach the wives of junior executives what to buy next and how to act in French restaurants. Yeah. And then my number one blurt, because I think it encapsulates the cognitive dissonance we were just talking about, where it's like, war is hell, but also, how do you get rid of it? What is life? I right. don't, I'm confused. This is, by the way, after they're sort of wandering around after the firebombing. So everyone is dead, and there's basically no reason to keep warring, if you know what I mean. Because all the buildings are blown up and everyone's dead. No one's a threat to you. Right. Nevertheless, American planes are flying over doing cleanup shooting down at anyone they see who's still alive after the bombing. The planes sprayed them with machine gun bullets, but the bullets missed. Then they saw some other people moving down by the riverside, and they shot at them. They hit them. So it goes. The idea was to hasten the end of the war. Yeah. Just that turn at the end, because that's also what they say about the A-bomb, right? How could you fucking drop an A-bomb on civilians in Hiroshima? Well... If we didn't, and the war went on X number of years longer, more people would have died. Yeah. That's also a good argument. It's a hard life we live in. It's like it's a hard world. So I just thought that blurt does a great job of presenting both. Like the whole beginning of the blurt, you're like, yeah, yeah, no violence, all love. And then it's like the idea was to hasten the end of the war. And you're like, you know what? I bet that is what they were thinking. Yeah, right. It's weird they that their really... good intentions can be let's shoot these civilians <laughs> for good reasons. <laughs> it's just tough that we live in a universe where choices like that exist. Yeah. Like, should we kill these civilians or should we kill these civilians? Sometimes that's the choice. That's terrible. And even how, like, apparently in the run up to using the A bomb, Truman or someone in his cabinet realized that if they didn't use it and then people found out that they had this instant war ender that they could have right. used, then everybody who was going to die after that in invading Japan by that land or something like that, they'll sue yeah. or be furious. It's weird. Or, yeah. it's, it's, I'm listening to an amazing podcast episode, Dan Carlin's Hardcore History. Check it out. Yeah. He just dropped a five-hour episode I'm called like 10 Destroyer minutes in right of now. Worlds. Yeah. Okay, I'm like four hours in. <laughs> it's great. Yeah, it goes into all this stuff, all the pros and cons of... Which I think this book has to be... Like, when the Tralfamadorians accidentally destroy the universe by testing rocket fuel, that's got to be a reference, I think, to the fact that when the A-bomb test happened, some scientists were saying, this is going to ignite the atmosphere and destroy the world. And they were still right. like, well, we're still going to test it. it. Yeah. We're just going to hope it doesn't. <laughs> yeah, they didn't know if it would work or work too well. Yeah. Or, yeah. or the chain reaction would stop. Or if it, would, if it affected every atom adjacent to itself, then the whole atmosphere would become an atomic blast. So I just think that's very woven in there in a cool way. And yeah, it's a great companion piece if you want to listen to that Dan Carlin episode. Because they talk about... This exact argument and like a famous pacifist, Bertrand Russell at the time, dedicated their whole life to writing like we can't have this war, we can't have this war. Then they invented the A-bomb and Russell completely switched his position and said, as a pacifist, I now realize we must immediately launch nukes at Russia and wipe them off the face of the earth. Because now that nukes exist, it's just a matter of time before other countries invent it. So like the only way the world can be safe is if one country wipes all the other countries that could develop nukes <laughs> off the face of the earth. And this is a guy who's a famous pacifist. Right. Like the nuke changed things so much that they thought that is now the humane thing to do. Right. And then later in his life, Russell and Einstein co-wrote a big proposal that's like, let's just please agree to not all nuke each other. So everyone's trying to figure out when humans now have the ability to kill incomprehensible numbers of each other yeah. from far away. How does morality change? What is moral? 
And it really makes you question if morality exists, like other than in little interpersonal instances, you know, yeah, like they say, you you kill one person, you're a murderer, you kill a million and you're a dictator or like, you know, you don't, if the death toll gets high enough, you stop being able to even conceive of it as like a murder. Yeah. Yeah. Just numbers. Yeah. One more blurt. I'm not going to read it verbatim because it's a whole chunk, but it's, I think there's two just individual chunks of the book that are my favorite parts. And one of them is about a third of the way in, Billy wanders downstairs in his house late at night and just puts on the TV and there's a war movie on. And then what happens is he becomes a very tiny amount unstuck in time. This is my favorite scene in the book. And so he goes to the end of the movie and sees it backwards and then sees it forwards from there. And though Kurt does this beautiful like page, page and a half description of seeing World War II in reverse. Like the bombers are picking up bombs from cities and rebuilding them by doing that. And then factory workers, mostly women, are dismantling the planes and then helping people hide the minerals that they were built with. It's so beautiful. That's what I love is that at the end he's like, and then they dismantled the bombs because the things inside were so dangerous. And they took these dangerous things and they buried them deep in the earth so that no one would ever be hurt by them. Yeah. And you're like, oh, if only. And it just, (laughs) yeah, and it turns the whole then passage of human life into an attempt to build Adam and Eve, two perfect people. Like, it's just, if you do the whole thing in reverse. what a good extended metaphor, yeah. Yeah, it's incredible. Yeah, he says, yeah, and as the people unbirthed each other back in time and back in time, they become like more and more innocent and perfected. Yeah. The end result of all human history being two happy people who get to live in a nice place and just be happy. Yeah. Like, wouldn't that be nice? (laughs) We got there. (laughs) Like the idea of it sucks that entropy means that if you believe it, but in the biblical mythology, we started in this state of perfection and the universe is a, has a way of shaking us up and shaking us up and it's all downhill from there. Yeah. But in reverse, it's so beautiful. <laughs> yeah. Where everything, everything, every particle in the universe is coming together to form a perfect whole. Yeah. That will, you know, be the big bang or whatever. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's mind blowing. It's, it's a great, great scene. Yeah. It would, it's just a great extended metaphor. Yeah. Nothing else to say about it. Yeah. I think we can go into another segment called Recurring Characters Update. Guess who's Diddy, back? Diddy, Diddy. Back again. I used this bit before. (laughs) I think I've already used that as a theme. It's always good. (laughs) And there's a bunch of them in this. There's a lot of past Vonnegut characters coming up. I wanted to do this segment because I want to talk about Kilgore Trout returning because he does kind of the other favorite individual chunk of mine in it. Kilgore Trout, we first find him in God Bless You, Mr. Rosewater. He is a struggling sci-fi novelist who's often sold as pornography. And he'll come up in Timequake later on. His son's in Galapagos, Kilgore's in Breakfast of Champions. He's all over later Kurt works from there. But he's the author of Gospel from Outer Space, which is throughout Kurt's books, if you've never read them, there's a lot of Kilgore Trout short stories where you just hear the basics of the story without reading the whole thing. And it's usually a sci-fi concept that Kurt wants to just express the idea of, and that's it. And Gospel from Outer Space is a attempt by Kilgore Trout to redo the Gospels in the Bible and argue that just because of sloppy narrative writing, we've been thoroughly misled by them. And he argues that because of how it's actually written in the Bible, we know the whole time that Jesus is a very, very important person. And so when he's going to be crucified, we just think, oh boy, they picked the wrong guy. Here it comes. And then Kilgore Trout argues that the rewrite he would do is Jesus is just a guy the entire time. And then once he's crucified, God comes down and says, Because Jesus was so nice and selfless, yeah, I heretofore name him Jesus. Because right. then it implies sort of like the Buddhist faith more does that godhood is within you. It's something that you could achieve as a human. Yeah. Whereas technically the Christian Bible implies you better be well connected. Yeah, yeah. The it's way, important to be the boss's son. <laughs> yeah, I think I think the way Kurt phrases it is it don't pick on a bum with no connections is like the new lesson of that. Is the Bible he would like, yeah. yeah. But it, whereas he thinks the point of the current Bible is don't fuck with the boss's son. <laughs> right, right, right. And he's like, that's not a <laughs> as useful a message as you thought it was when you wrote the Bible, whoever wrote the Bible. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, it's, and he kind of implies like, that's probably what you meant and you just messed up. Sure. Yeah, you yeah. just poorly wrote it. And so that's probably my other, it's it's like an entire cat's cradle in one chunk of the book. It's just amazing. Yeah, and those are great. All the trout things that are like quick wrap-ups. He does another irreverent one where 
it's Jesus and Joseph and Jesus is being Joseph's apprentice learning to be a carpenter while he's like in his mid teens. Yeah. And it just describes a scene where a Roman soldier comes in and says they need to build this new fangled con- wooden contraption, shows them the blueprints and Joseph's like, I think we can do that. And they build it and it's a cross and they give it to the soldier and the soldier goes and yeah. crucifies someone for the first time. And Jesus and Joseph are pleased that they got the work and that it worked out well. <laughs> Dun, dun, dun. Like, right. I don't know what it means, but it is cool. It makes yeah. you think or whatever. Yeah. And I can't remember. There were two more, they said. There's one called the Gutless Wonder, which is not a Jesus thing. But Is that the robot with halitosis? Yeah. I thought that was one of... I was like, that doesn't need to be a whole story. That's weak. <laughs> That's a yeah, weak story. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. A robot that has bad breath and then gets rid of the bad breath and people like it. But it's, and it's also like a big murderer. <laughs> like I it know. Causes it a lot a of stuff. Stuff. It's just yeah. really ham-fisted. <laughs> a robot whose job is to drop jellied gasoline on enemy soldiers and kill yeah. hundreds of people. And no one judges it for the murder. Exactly. The but they breath. judge it because it has bad breath. Then it gets yeah. good breath and they all accept it. And no one cares about the murder. Yeah. Get it? <laughs> Trout is not as subtle as Vonnegut. Nope. But what was the other? There's a third one that's mentioned. And it's the story from which he pulls the idea of being in an alien zoo. But it has a different punchline in the Trout story as described in the book, which is people are brought to an alien zoo. I know. I think the story is called The Big Board. And the Big it's, Board! And it's people are... It's great. Humans are brought to an alien zoo and the entertainment for them in their exhibit is a stock market. It's all fake. It's all made up. But they watch the people really freak out or get sad or get excited about how their stocks are doing, even though yeah. it's all imaginary. So that's not what happens to Billy or in his imagination happens to Billy. Yeah. But in the book he stole that idea from, Yeah, they show a sequence of flashing numbers in the zoo cage for the humans. And it's amazing how the humans will just respond ecstatically when the number goes up and be really depressed when the number goes down, even though it means nothing and is tied to nothing. And I think that's a great satire yeah. story. That's cool. It's really good. The Big yeah. Board. Yeah, some of the best Trout stuff in this one, for sure. It's also, it's sort of, a lot like Time Quake is later on, it's sort of an all-star team of key characters from his other books. Howard W. Campbell, the main character of Mother Night, is in this. Elliot Rosewater, the main character of God Bless You, Mr. Rosewater, is in this. Also, the planet Tralfamador, which we first found in Sirens of Titan, and it's the key thing there. Also, he does the aliens differently in this one than they are in Sirens of yeah, Titan. Yeah, they've completely changed form. Yeah. Now they are described as a plumber's friend, which I figured I out through context clues is what we call a plunger. Yeah. But I guess we they have used to call it a name. plumber's friend. Yeah. They're like green plungers with a hand at the top of the stick. Yeah. And the hand has an eyeball in the center of the palm. Yeah. And they communicate telepathically. Nothing at all like Salo or Salo, depending on how you pronounce it. Yeah. <laughs> as way. described in Sirens. Yeah. Because in Sirens, the aliens, there was an organic life form on Trail from Ador, and then they kept building better and better machines. Maybe and then the machines Salo's become the a aliens. machine, but the. Tralfamadorians are the biological forebears of... Yeah, so it could be kind of different eras. But you could also... if you wanted to, but we've also revealed before that Vonnegut doesn't particularly give a shit if the universes yeah. don't match up perfectly. So it might yeah. just not match up. Because <laughs> well, also I think Sirens of Titan and, and this book kind of happen in the same period of Earth history. So it wouldn't make sense right. for there to but be Right, but I'm just saying with the Diana Moon glampers and whatnot, I've kind of yeah. given up on trying to make them all work as hard as that is for me. Like, yeah, there's a, not a unified a, universe yeah. of it, yeah. We already talked about the gross picture of a pony having sex with a lady. <laughs> you uh, consider that a character? <laughs> comes up a lot. Uh, like, Ilium's really a character in this novel. <laughs> this drawing of a woman having sex with a horse is also really a character in this novel. <laughs> Everyone leaves the press conference. Because <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. uh, in God Bless You, Mr. Rosewater, Lila Buntline has that picture in her like catalog of smut. So it's all over. There's also a Rumford in this. His name's Lance Rumford. It's funny, you know, that's just some weird porn that he saw and really stuck with him. Well, apparently... Like today, that would be Tub Girl appearing in multiple yeah. novels or something. Because <laughs> in, in research... We'll, we'll link to Tub Girl in the footnotes if you're unfamiliar. <laughs> uh, Brett says a, no. A head shaking. Brett's no? Brett's shaking Great. his head. Okay. okay, I guess good. there's no room or something? Anyway. <laughs> well, also, apparently that picture is not real. It's just something that... He Wait, made a leap girl? and came. Oh no, the uh, the horse and the lady. But he made a leap and came up with it. And then also Bernard V. O'Hare is a real person. Wait, in this wait, book. wait, wait, wait. He what? made a leap that a woman might have had sex with a horse at some time in human history. I'm sorry, but I mean, Catherine the Great was rumored to have sex with horses. That's not even a leap. Yeah. 
That's true. Let me Probably let me clear this up for something. anyone who's wondering or like children right. who don't know this. All right, people have fucked horses. <laughs> you don't have to wonder. There's no question about it. Mm. Go see Equus. People <laughs> fuck horses. End of story. Don't have to go out on a limb, yeah. Kurt. <laughs> don't worry. They don't do it in the play. Yeah. For real. It's made up. And Bernard B. O'Hare, there's a completely different version of him called Bernard B. O'Hare in Mother Night. And uh, there's also a Captain Bernard O'Hare in Slapstick, who's a helicopter pilot, briefly. So he uses his real friend's name a lot, but yeah. he's only the real he's person the in this He's the Porkins of the Vonnegut universe. Yeah. Always just like a pilot who doesn't matter. Yeah. <laughs> and then also, last character to talk about is a segment called Kurt Cameo. A cameo is a small metal thing with an engraving in it. I just thought I'd let Thank you, let you know. Webster's Dictionary. Because uh, all Webster's obviously. Webster's Dictionary defines cameo as. <laughs> Kurt obviously kind of does an oblique version of himself in almost all of his novels. This one, he's literally in it. He's the first chapter, the last chapter, and also multiple times in the Billy Pilgrim POW experiences will just be another guy in the unit doing great one liners and bits. Yeah, he just says one witty line from the back of the crowd usually <laughs> yeah and then it'll be like that guy that said that funny thing that was me yeah yeah and also i in at least some of his books the main character is sort of an oblique kurt cameo but in this one billy pilgrim is not directly based on kurt it's based on a guy in his unit named joe crone who was captured with him a pow with him struggled the entire way throughout their imprisonment and died in dresden kurt was bunking with him when he was sick enough to die on the day of his death so he didn't die from the bombs he died from illness yeah, he yeah. was. They were both in the same bunk, and apparently Joe was like, "I feel terrible." And Kurt was like, "Yeah, I, I guess just stay in bed. We'll get you some help." And then they got him some help, but he died anyway, and he just died sure. of illness. That makes sense because all the Kurt surrogate characters are very different than Billy. Yeah, Billy is very like simple and sweet, and thinks in a different way. Yeah, and and it's pretty cool that I think that he was able to capture it through the view point of another person instead of doing what he always does and just having himself do it. Right. right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's kind of. I feel like he's kind of a mix of this real guy and Elliot Rosewater. I would say. Yeah. And so, like, when they're in the hospital together and become best friends, it's very believable. Oh, like, <laughs> and it's. I love that this gives you the origin story of Elliot Rosewater because in the hospital they describe Elliot being really nice to him. Yeah. And the reason why is because Elliot had recently decided to try and be very nice and giving to everyone he met around him. He had a dim idea that maybe this would make the world a better place to live in. Yeah. Which is awesome. It's like, <laughs> yeah, I know what happens after that. A bunch of stuff. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah, the firebombing of Indianapolis. For exactly. One thing. Yeah. Ooh, it makes you wonder if... Well, Billy was living through the firebombing of Dresden. It, that's what projected through telepathy, the image of the firebombing of Ilium into the head of Elliot Rosewater. Oh, Indianapolis. But yeah, yeah. Whatever. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Whatever. All those yeah, eyes. Swapping cities. stories. Yeah. I'm going to eventually write a really boring after hours <laughs> where all the Vonnegut <laughs> things are connected <laughs> and Howard Campbell is a sentient car. <laughs> <laughs> From there, I think we can get into another segment called Vana What? He's falling. What? <laughs> He's Wiley Coyote, just all the way down. Vana uh, This is a segment where we talk about things that are maybe problematic or racist or anything else. Uh, yeah, although I think it's largely become the segment where we acknowledge that he sucks at writing women. Pretty much, That's, yeah. That seems to be the sticking point most of the time for me. It's pretty, it's pretty overwhelmingly that, and then occasionally an antique term for other races. Occasionally some dated that's racism, pretty much it. Yeah. yeah. I think Gollywogs made it into this book in an unpleasant way, uh, Yeah. in a problematic way. Yeah, and <laughs> with some of those racist terms, it's this kind of tangent, but I think he, he just likes kind of some of the chewiness of the word. Like, it's not even that he wants to be, it's yeah. just like gollywog is a fun word if it's, it's if it's in a vacuum and independent it's a, of yeah. its meaning Hoy. yeah but anyway this book has i think valencia Merble is not necessarily a great <laughs> character because she i think is killed pretty brutally for being yeah. overweight no there's <laughs> a big fat stupid ugly woman which he loves yeah who the protagonist doesn't fully love who dies horribly yeah there's a starlet who's constantly naked who only exists to be fucked by him in space. Right. What are the other female characters? Well, They're not great. Oh, mainly, and his daughter. Sorry, his daughter yeah. about whom 
one of the few insights into the way she thinks we get is when she's saying you should come live with us or stay in an old folks home it says it was very exciting for her taking his dignity away in the name of love yeah so it's like his daughter's a mean ungrateful bitch for no reason yeah she's just a nag yeah for, yeah. for no reason <laughs> Because there are these characters, and then there also aren't a ton of female characters, partly because we're following male military Morris. units, and that's the way it is. But also... That's the way it is. Sorry, honey. Yeah. You got a tricks. problem? It's the way it was this Babe. And <laughs> also, my initial thought was, oh, but there's this great female character in the book in Mary O'Hare. What a great character. She has this very legitimate objection to the thing. But then barely I realized... Barely an extra. For one thing, right. Barely in the book. And then also, he might have successfully written her as a real person because she was a real person. <laughs> like, it's it's yeah, an like actual person that he dealt too with. Much. Yeah. So he, it's not hard to just translate a real thoughtful cool woman into that if you're directly writing them as a real person. And, and it's odd because some of his short stories we talked about and, and even some of the previous novels to this, I think he did a better job of writing women from time to time. And then this one, he really does not succeed. <laughs> yeah, yeah, if I can read the quotes just back to back. Here is the first line describing his wife, the most prominent female in the book. Yeah. And then the next line describes Montana Wildhack, the next female lead. Yeah, And I think they... It really does a good job of capturing the Madonna whore complex that I think Kurt has a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, okay, Valencia. Her name was Valencia Merble. Valencia was the daughter of the owner of the Ilium School of Optometry. She was rich. She was as big as a house because she couldn't stop eating. She was eating now. She was eating a Three Musketeers candy bar. She was ugly. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the one type of woman that's allowed to exist in the Kurt universe. And the other yeah. type is this kind with hips like a liar is the other category of woman. Great. This is how he describes Montana Wildhack, who is basically the Manzano, the Mona Manzano of this book. Yeah. She was a dull person, but a sensational invitation to make babies. Men looked at her and wanted to fill her up with babies right away. <laughs> <laughs> Right. Those are the two functions of women in the world. <laughs> yeah. Well, and also, and because we've watched the movie of the book, which we'll talk about a little later, but I feel like the movie really emphasized that for me because did, yeah. the movie is very faithful to the book. And Kurt was. Other than a few small changes that I yeah. really disliked. <laughs> yeah, true. Yeah. But uh, Kurt felt like it was too. He wrote a letter to his friend Dan Wakefield once and he said, they did the movie just like they did Gone with the Wind. They simply put the novel on the screen. Like he was very happy with, he felt that despite More those or changes. Less. It's pretty close. They pretty yeah. much did it. And so in doing that with these characters, Valencia is mostly fat jokes and, and whining. Awful. Yeah. And then Montana is pretty much just naked in just the movie. Just boobs. Except one, <laughs> one part where she's given a shirt by Billy and is immediately shirt. like, yeah. oh, you must be a nice man. Let's have sex now right because you were willing <laughs> so, for me to be clothed let's get yeah. naked and have sex so as a movie you're like oh yeah that's pretty and much I it huh i thought the yeah. worst of all was the scene where kilgore trout is running the paper route you know because kilgore trout is such an unsuccessful novelist he has to be the head of a paper route like yeah handle which is the a, children oh yeah which is a scam and the line is <laughs> one of the newspaper boys was actually a newspaper girl she was electrified they electrocute her to death just because she's a paper girl oh I seems extreme to me no, they just meant she's excited. Oh. I'm making a joke and you're looking at me with a blank face. <laughs> I'm gullible, okay? <Yeah. laughs> I am easy to fool. They mean she's excited to be there doing the yeah. thrilling work of a paper boy. Never mind. <laughs> but Moving she is on. the dumbest paper boy. The paper no, girl. yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah. He does. He That's goes true. out of his way to point out that one of the paper boys was a girl in disguise and she was the dumbest one. <laughs> <laughs> Can I throw out the one section that was really racially problematic to me. Sure. Yeah. Or do you we're have on, more? We're, we're on a wedding. Bashing? That was it for the ladies. Okay. That's it for the ladies. Now <laughs> one for the fellas. He was stopped by a signal in the middle of Ilium's black ghetto. The people who lived here hated it so much that they had burned down a lot of it a month before. It was all they had and they'd wrecked it. There was a tap yeah. on Billy's car window. A black man was there. He <laughs> wanted to talk about something. The light had changed. Billy did the simplest thing. He drove on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which is just like, ooh, I hate embedding the argument that people who riot yeah. deserve the damage done to their community or whatever. That's, that's just, like, I mean, we, yeah. we know that that's not cool and that it's not as simple as that and you don't say that. And that just slipped through as a dated 
thought, I think. And also, like, some people but, do oof. still say that. That's definitely Well, some people thing. think it, but I think they're <laughs> assholes. And you can right. argue with me online about it if you want. Yeah, because that's... That people goes... who riot are largely acting out of desperation because of the circumstances they're in. Right. <laughs> um, yeah. But that one does go beyond, oh, Kurt used an old term. Like, nah, that's, no, that's some retrograde. No, he has an old-fashioned thought that's yeah, pretty that's... mean-spirited. Especially yeah. for Kurt Vonnegut to have. Right. They're yeah, like, yeah. look at these people wrecking their neighborhood. <laughs> and you're like... Yeah. That's what alt right people say now, Kurt. <laughs> Chill out. Yeah. And it's sorta of, it's sort of a bummer that there's so much Bono what in what is probably for many people the only Kurt Vonnegut book they've read. Sure. So that's their sense of him too. And is, why did there have to know? be a scene where you see a black gentleman so you drive away? Right. <laughs> just didn't need to no need. be in there, didn't add to anything. Never comes up. Never comes up. Yeah. Uh the last one I wanted to say is in the intro. So I just have a question for you. The line is, sometimes I try to call up old girlfriends on the telephone late at night after my wife has gone to bed. Okay, that's in the preface, which is Kurt speaking as himself. Yes. Is he telling, is this like blurred lines where he's in the book? He's saying, hey, wife, also sometimes I cheat on you. And now you know because it's in this book. So I don't know if that was his intention, but there's some, weird. there's some background stuff where his book before this chronologically was Welcome to the Monkey House. But in terms of actually what he was working on for the most part, his previous novel was God Bless You, Mr. Rosewater in 1965. And between then and 1969, when he writes this, a lot happens in his personal life. And one of those things is his marriage coming apart. He, starting in 1965, started teaching at the University of Iowa. So he moved away and was in a long-distance relationship. He was doing that for two years. He also, while he was there, there's a line in, later in the book where he mentions that in Kurt's real life, he, I think he phrases it, he, I got into some beautiful trouble and then got out of it again. Yeah. That was a brief romantic affair while he was at Iowa. He also, in his letters... So the damage was done, so it was okay to talk about his marriage because yeah. it was post it had already been destroyed <laughs> by by 1966 and in, in his letters he's writing to knox that he feels like he and jane the quote in january 1966 he writes to his good friend knox Berger, quote something telepathic has busted between us meaning me and jane and i don't know how to fix it i'd like to fix it but and then he goes on to describe how the marriage seems to be coming apart and she comes up less and less in his letters and by around 1970 they have split up He's moved to New York, and that's it for the marriage. It's hard to say whether it was the distance or just yeah. getting older or having kids or, or the affair or what, but it all kind of came apart there. So he was putting out Slaughterhouse-Five when he was essentially done being married, if not separated. He talks about in another letter in, it was 1968, he's telling Knox Berger, I finished my war book. And I don't know what to do next with myself. And then he also mentions casually that I sit around here at home with my thumb up my ass while my wife works her guts out at McCarthy headquarters, which was Eugene McCarthy running for mm-hmm. president in 68. But I think even then there's a hint of like, yeah, we're kind of we're kind of being separate people now. I don't, I don't right. know exactly sure. what to do. So in, in the book, I, sad. It's, yeah, it's very <laughs> sad that the marriage has come apart. But also this is his first novel where he's writing from the perspective of I'm no longer with this high school yeah. sweetheart of mine and, and no longer in this relationship. Wah, wah. So that so when he's calling up old girlfriends, I think it's it's yeah. coming from that state of our marriage is kind of disintegrating. Yeah. yeah, like it's real. <laughs> I thought he was a sleazy playboy. He's a sad, broken down wreck. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Should have expected that. That's usually what Kurt is, not a playboy. Yeah, but I guess he was being honest. Yeah, you exactly. Know? So that's something. And also, in terms of new things in his books, I think we can get into another segment called Vana Art. Oh, can we? Vana Art. Oh, shall we? Oh, should we? It's art time now, is it? (laughs) A little bit of art then, isn't it? Yeah. This is a a new segment. Let's cock it up. Let's celebrate. Because this is the first Kurt Vonnegut novel with doodles in it. This is, if you know about uh, Kurt's... Well, all of mine have doodles in them, but I doodled them in there. Oh, right. Other novels of his, I think, are more famous for having asterisks in them or having other drawings he does. But this one, he puts in a couple of drawings. There's one of a gravestone that says, everything was beautiful and nothing hurt. And then later on, there's a prison latrine sign from the camp he was in, uh, or that Billy was in is seeing that says, please leave this latrine as tidy as you found it. And that's like white letters on, on black. And then toward the very end of the book, there's a drawing of Montana Wild Hacks breasts with... Fellas! What? 
And it has uh, her pendant between Page them. Page 241 if you just want to see them titties. <laughs> Flip right to it. <laughs> and, the, and the pendant between them has the serenity prayer on it, which you see in Billy's office earlier. Yeah. But that's it. There's just re- seemingly very randomly, there's just a couple of doodles in the book. Yeah, which I, it's weird for there to only be three. For one of them, the latrine one, to add nothing whatsoever. Nothing. I don't. Yeah. That one really doesn't. He could mean have just anything. said what the sign said. Yeah. And not to. I don't know. But it's like he's dipping his toe in the doodle water. Yeah. <laughs> it's a weird phrase. <laughs> dipping my Gross. toe in the doodle water. That'll get you sick. And uh, as we'll see, he'll doodle more and more obsessively as he ages. Yeah. But this is the official beginning of the doodles. Yeah, and I do. I think the gravestone is the one that's aesthetically appealing on its own. And, and impactful, really nice. for sure, yeah. Yeah, the other ones are just sort of, I guess you wanted to draw boobs. And <laughs> the boobs one, the moment is impactful, but he could have just as easily said she had a locket hanging between her naked breasts and the locket read this, blah, 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 blah. Right. I don't know why that one's a doodle. But I don't know why he chooses when he chooses to doodle instead of not. Yeah. And I think that'll be really interesting, especially in Breakfast. This segment will probably be longer because there's more doodles, but also because I'll want to talk about like, why do you think doodles? Why doodles over writing? You know what I mean? Why, why did that become such a staple of his style? But I don't need to get into it now because there's only three in here. Yeah. And we covered them. From there, I don't know exactly how long this segment will be, but let's do a segment called The Meat. It's long. So long. It's the longest meat I ever seen. Like Billy's Tremendous Wang, which is uh-huh. a very funny just oh, yeah. joke in this that you never know who will get one. It's great. It's the first iteration of Kurt's favorite joke, which is arbitrarily deciding the dick length of various characters. Yeah. <laughs> uh, he will use the shit out of that in Breakfast of Champions, but he only does it once here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and um, I think there's like one big question for just this book itself and then one overall Kurt one. The book one is whether it's PTSD or sci-fi like we talked about before a bit. And then overall for Kurt... This is, I think, culturally and as far as he's rated, the landmark Kurt novel. And does that make sense? You know, is that even a thing? That can kind of be a next segment anyway. But I think I kind of encapsulated my thoughts up top. Yeah. And I can expound more on them. But in a nutshell, I think it is supposed to be PTSD. Yeah. This read through was the first time I thought that. And I think that that bit of selling out, so to speak, and like obfuscating your sci-fi roots, Kurt, <laughs> I think that's what made it palatable enough to become the standout like novel, Kurt Vonnegut novel. I, because I was born more in the future, sci-fi is really popular now. So I really didn't understand. I think the stigma he talks about in many of his books, I'm starting to feel that, oh yeah, it was real. Like I yeah. thought it might've been something he just bitched about to have something funny to be crotchety about. But like, I really am feeling that in the arc of his life, he felt pressured to obfuscate the sci-fi elements of this novel. And that may indeed be why it's the number one Kurt Vonnegut novel is specifically because he was willing to betray his sci-fi roots. (laughs) So I love it. I would put it in the top three Kurt novels for sure. I would not put it number one. I would still put Sirens number one. And the reason is, is because it swings big. It has no fears about being imaginative or sci-fi. Right. And that's just what I like. Let's be combining about these. We're also going to do another segment called Vana Grades. Smash them together. The meat and the grades. Grade A meat. It's where they meet. <laughs> if you've never heard the show, there was a part of the book Palm Sunday, which is a kind of collage by Kurt with a lot of nonfiction in it, where he gives himself grades relative to himself on a bunch of his books. And so we're going to give him grades too, like we have been. And uh, he gave Slaughterhouse-Five an A+. Plus. He only also gave an A-plus to Cat's Cradle. That's the top. That's it of like 13 of his Mm. books. Okay, so what's your grade? And you have to also answer the previous segment, which you Yeah, Yeah, (laughs) Yeah, yeah, we're combining. I think I would give it a solid A, and I would also discourage people from making this their first Kurt Vonnegut book because I think this book, in a very good way, it works like a band's greatest hits album. Where if you just consume that on its own, it's going to be amazing and it's going to have a lot of stuff from all over their careers and it's going to be really great. But then if you start with that greatest hits and go on to their other stuff, you'll be like, oh, yeah, I already know kind of the big stuff from this one, huh? Like, I I met Elliot Rosewater before. I mean, I guess this novel's fine, you know? I think it's like not a great one to start out with, but it has amazing parts of it and 
in a really good way combines a lot of his previous work and it it really stands on its own very very well but i think i'd still put it behind sirens number two cat's cradle number one and i understand that to a lot of people it's weird of me that i'm more affected by sirens emotionally I mean, they both deal with death and loss and grief, but Sirens is so imaginative or quote unquote wacky, for lack of a better, less insulting word, yeah. that I totally get why. I would give it an A plus, by the way. I do think it's probably his tightest, most coherent novel, but I do think in the Oscar Beatty way, it gets extra credit just because it's about war and it really happened yeah. to him. Yeah, so yeah. people feel obliged to be like, you know, the horrors of war is such a well-trod topic that if you write a good horrors of war novel, it feels very important. I would argue that even though Sirens of Titan feels like a fanciful romp through space, it's just as seriously dealing with things like the inevitability of our own deaths and shit. It just does it through these wacky harmoniums and stuff. I don't know why that speaks to me more. Most people, this one will probably speak to you more because the things that are horrible that are happening are very, very relatable and really happened in history. Yeah. So it's not like you have to go far out of your way to imagine being chronos and classically infundibulated. Right. You can be like, no, no, the firebombing, you know what a bombing looks like. You have enough iconography in your brain to imagine how horrible that would be. Yeah. So I think just because of how horrible it is and it may have the highest density of great Kurt Blurts. Am I, of any. Yeah. Like there were so many more we could have done. And so many of the quotes that have stood the test of time are from this one. It's really tight. It really washes over you in like a cavalcade of kaleidoscopic scenes. Yeah. And it's very emotionally wrought. A plus. But if you'll it's recall, great. I gave Sirens an A plus plus plus. So it's yes. still not. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, it, and I think getting at why the real firebombing of Dresden doesn't quite hit as hard as, as some of those other fictional ones, I think. This book and God bless you, Mr. Rosewater, for me, suffer a little bit because the main character is such a cipher. Like he's just getting kind of blown in the wind. Billy so has no feelings about the horror. He just yeah. recognizes that it's unfolding around him. He's kind of a vegetable. Yeah. Yeah. And I think some other Kurt books, he does a better job of making the emotional payoffs hit because the character is such a, a more fleshed out person. With more, with Campbell, more motive and more. Campbell from Mother Night felt so real to me, and yeah. I knew all the nuanced thoughts that he was having in his head. Billy, I think it was a choice. Billy seems from the very beginning like shell shock has hollowed out his brain a little. Yeah, like he really seems like he's just in a daze, wandering around, experiencing this stuff. And I don't think it's because Vonnegut can't write a fleshed out main character. It's he really is that way. Billy is kind of a cipher in sure. his life. He's like uh, yeah, yeah. one of my favorite films of all time, uh, being there. He's like Chauncey Gardner. Yes. Yeah. He's just wandering around wow. looking at stuff. That's a good fit <laughs> yeah. for this. I hadn't thought of that. Yeah, when, it's like the reverse Chauncey Gardner. Yeah. yeah. And I've, and Everything, I've heard, everyone he invo gets involved with suffers because of it instead of benefiting. Yeah. <laughs> well, and Kurt is right to make Billy and Elliot ciphers. Like, it, it makes oh, sense. Billy it makes Elliot. The, Book of, oh, Billy. There's got to be a connection there. <laughs> got to be. It, like, I don't criticize him for doing it. It just makes the book hit a little less hard for me. You know? Sure. It's the way it is. We only have a few more segments, but one of them is movie time. A few movie time. means three, probably. <laughs> so this one and then two more. Don't worry, guys. We're almost done. I know it's long. I'm doing a camera. I'm doing a camera. Oh, the theme is just dragging on and on. <laughs> There's uh, This book has a movie that is probably the most highly regarded Vonnegut movie or adaptation, and it also came out in That's 1972. Right. Dune. So, <laughs> 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 the Slaughterhouse Five movie was in 1972. It was directed by George Roy Hill, who did uh, The Sting and did Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, and a lot of other movies you probably know. Slapshot. He's a very skilled director from the era right before editing and directing and jib shots and stuff got really complicated. Yeah. It's really interesting, actually, because it's like filmically right on the cusp of what I would call modern movies that have fast pacing and are very willing to like force you to understand stuff by cutting rapidly from shot to shot. Yeah. And that classic feel like Dr. Zhivago where it's like, oh, you just filmed a play. So it's right. weird because the scenes will be like, oh, it's like an old John Wayne movie where they just filmed a play, but it's starting to use interesting editing techniques and special effects in an interesting way. So it felt a little dated and clunky in the way their classic film can, but I think George Roy Hill is probably an excellent director. Yeah. who was hampered a bit by the technology of the time. And he 
I think, got a kick out of doing the snappy, unstuck-in-time edits as much as he could at the time. Yes. There's a lot of zooms and a lot of match cuts and a lot yeah. of lining up of things. But, like, even the acting, like, Paul Lazaro, I thought, was very right on the border of, like, you know, we do naturalistic acting now in most movies, right. but he was a little, like... Listen to me, you son of a bitch. I'll catch you no matter where you go. If anyone asks you what the sweetest thing is, it's revenge. And I'm not saying he did a bad job. I thought the actor was good. But that style of acting at the time seems really non-natural to us now. It's kind of stagey. And also the special effects are... Abysmal. Yeah. But again, I'm not blaming the production. Like what? Yeah. It's the way I don't know how what good you could have accomplished the firebombing of Dresden in 1972. Yeah. And the alien ship is just a, a blob of light. And you <laughs> right. never see the aliens. No and, CG, folks. And that could be a choice somebody would make anyway, but it was clearly something he wasn't going to do. So cause... glad they didn't try to show the plunger <laughs> right. hand like, aliens. Yeah, like they a just weird made Muppet, them you know? a disembodied voice, which is a good choice. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, they could have got Jim Henson on it, but no. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think of it, though, as far as a companion to the book? Or, I don't know, if someone wasn't going to read the book, would you recommend the movie instead? It's interesting because it's sort of like the Mother Night movie where it's pretty faithful to beat by beat exactly what happens. But they're also... They're With doing... the notable exception, yeah. sorry, I just got to say that sure. that a few details here and there, as we said earlier, make it explicitly PTSD and not sci-fi. Yeah, yeah. But other than that, yeah, like scene for scene, it's very, very similar. Yeah. And I think also it, this is maybe the first of the Kurt books we've gone through where I feel like yeah, that there's a reason to make it a movie. Like it just it works pretty well as a film. I think like the story is that size and that amount of movement, and it's interesting. It's, it definitely felt like it had more reason to exist than yeah. the Mother Night movie, even though both were really faithful. Yeah. That said, it's such a short book that's so good, <laughs> right? That I would say if you're gonna watch the movie, spend one or two extra hours and read the book. Yeah. I enjoyed seeing it having read the book. And I think it was worth making. And I guess if you're so busy that you're never going to read one of the best books ever written, see the movie. So you know what we're talking about on a great podcast. But it was at the end, it was so faithful that I still was like, well, this isn't better than my imagination. And some movie adaptations I really think are like One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, both an amazing book and an amazing movie. And they're so different that they're completely different artistic experiences worth having. Yeah. I feel like if you read the book, you can see the movie optionally. And if you haven't read the book, don't see the movie without reading the book, even though it's good. It's so much little extra effort to read the book. Right. And you get a lot more out of it. Not that the movie is bad, but straight up, like one of the best things about Kurt are these blurts we do. Those mostly don't make it into the movie because it's narration, not dialogue. Yeah. And I think that's part of the overall problem adapting him is so much of it is very good prose writing. So like little moments of good prose writing. So as a movie, it's just, oh, there it is. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, Kurt Vonnegut, I think more than most authors, if you lose the narrator, you're really losing a lot. Yeah. So it's all right. So it was good. (laughs) And uh, there's also one other adaptation to briefly talk about is that the BBC, BBC Radio, those Brits, they did a 2009 radio play version of Slaughterhouse-Five. And the big jump out thing for you Tumblr fans and stuff is that the guy who plays Moriarty in Sherlock is Billy Pilgrim. He's, I think his name's Andrew Scott. And I kind of felt the same way as the movie where I was like, they did a good faithful job and the acting was good to excellent. But yeah. not so good that it was better than my imagination. And exactly. it took almost as long to listen to as it did to read the book. Yeah, it's a lot of So time. it's a short book. <laughs> I feel like we're being mean, or I am, but I really don't mean it this way. I think adaptations are valid and they were good adaptations. Still read the book instead. <laughs> yeah, the, especially this one. It's such a short and incredible book that it's worth doing. Definitely. But the radio play is well produced and everything, yeah. Yeah, they did. and I really, I really liked Andrew Scott's performance a lot. In particular. I agree, but I mean, my God. He was, if you're literally going to listen to actors do a radio, very faithful radio play of it, just listen to the book on tape of Slaughterhouse-Five. Right. Like, get the yeah. actual words in your ear. You're so right. close. Or just, you know, say it in your head as you do yeah. when we read. I guess people want yeah. actors to tell them how the words sound. I don't know. Right, right, yeah. So that's that, I think. And uh, we can go into another segment called Related Reading. Oh, finally. Oh. Are we cousins? Are we siblings? Are we uncles? Are we cussing? Are we grandparents? Are we cussing on this? <laughs> Gold darn it. As always, this is when we pull out things that are just other great P 
pieces that remind us of this book. Also, I think we pulled a lot of movies in the process of this that are good companions. And yeah. I feel like the most recent one is Arrival. Really got a kick out of that movie. Yeah, it was all right. Yeah. <laughs> that's a separate podcast episode. Yeah, yeah. I have problems with it, but that's like, let's seriously not even get into it right now. <laughs> great, great. Skipping it. Text. Skipping it. What's related? I only have two. Um, and oh, one, of them really? is, one of them is Bradbury, because I always do that, and also because he relates all the time. And it's a short story called Tomorrow's Child. It's from a collection called I Sing the Body Electric. And it's a short story about a couple who, it opens with they've had their baby in the hospital. And the doctors are like, uh, we don't quite know what to tell you. And it turns out that the baby is a blue pyramid. It's not, a, it doesn't <laughs> look or seem like a human. Yeah. And the problem is something happened where it was born in a different dimension. And so we're seeing it in our dimension as a blue pyramid. And so it's the process of the parents trying to still love each other and love this blue pyramid and continue to function. <laughs> That's great. And it's a really fascinating, it's sort of a baby unstuck in dimension story. And so it's really great. So were you reminded of that because of the bit in this where they, Trail Famidorians, explain how human reproduction works? Yeah, because it, it's, it's, yeah. it's a lot we of... We didn't cover that, but as an aside, they tell Billy that, because they can see oh, in yeah. the fourth dimension... yeah. That you didn't know this, but there's actually seven dimensions even on Earth of Earthlings. And he's like, what do you mean? And they're like, well, how do you think you make human babies? And he's right. like, a it, man and a woman have sex. And they're like, see, you didn't realize this, but you can't see any time beings. But every time a baby is made, it takes seven humans. Yeah. There's it's like, amazing. Yeah, so, yeah, it's there's great. seven distinct genders. Five of them exist in the fourth dimension. Yeah. So you're not aware of it. But the reason you only conceive sometimes is the times that you conceived, it was because all seven of you were there fucking at the same time. In like, like in, in the like same place, sense. in a yeah. sense. Yeah, and they gave him all these weird rules that he couldn't understand. They're like, so for example, if you had the right fourth dimensional context, two gay dudes could have a baby, but you could never make a baby without a woman over 65 present. Right. Like, like there's and these like, rules that you can't parse because yeah. they don't make sense. And it was like two gay women can't reproduce. Yeah, it was two just gay all these women really can't reproduce, weird, but like, two gay dudes could if there's a fourth dimensional woman there. Right. Yeah. It's like, oh, yeah. Okay. And so it's, it's a perfect way for that and also just trying to function where you're between dimensions and times and everything else. Nice. I have six, so I'm going to do three really fast yeah. to divvy it up evenly. Yeah, yeah. The first one's an album by Roger Waters of Pink Floyd fame, but after oh. his solo career. I think it's a really underrated album. Everyone knows and loves The Wall because it's a cool concept story album. Radio Chaos, K-A-O-S, is an awesome Roger Waters album that is similarly a story from beginning to end. Yeah. Uh, concept album. The music rules. The story is fucking awesome. And it's about a crazy person named Billy calling into a radio show to explain how the world really works. So that ties in. Oh, that does. Uh, you could imagine that Radio Chaos is the final moments of Billy Pilgrim's life if you wanted to. Yeah, it would, or even it that, would work out. Or even that radio call that he does when he first tells That's what I meant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not the final moments of his life, but yeah. the radio show he appeared on. Next, a graphic novel. The collection's called The Pushman and Other Stories, but we were talking about how Trout does these great encapsulated stories. In the past, I pitched Pillow Man by Martin McDonough for the same reason. I love when an author can just reel off an elevator pitch for a story and you go, that's a great story too. Wow. Yeah. So uh, one of the first Japanese pioneers of graphic storytelling, Yoshihiro Tatsumi, I hope I'm saying that right, but we'll have a link to it. And it's a collection of basically his short graphic novels. Cool. He did like 16 page comic books that tell these really amazing human depressing as shit stories <laughs> very unorthodox comics really cool and then my harlan ellison that i always have to do yeah this time i'm gonna go with the classic i have no mouth and i must scream if you're an ellison fan you've definitely read it even if you're not you probably have heard that phrase before but if you're not familiar it's a really cool story about a group of poor humans who are essentially prisoners of an all-powerful computer being that reminded me a lot of the prison camp segments of this. And uh, the computer being is endlessly tormenting them for all of eternity. And so I wanted to shout out that short story is dope. And if you're not aware, there's a classic point-and-click adventure game version of that story narrated by harlan ellison himself like he plays oh, the wow. voice of the robot that is available on steam if you like playing retro point and click adventure games oh, wow, i so have no mouth and i'm a scream was a good point and click like a telltale kind of thing yeah yeah exactly oh, wow yeah like dig or king's quest or any of those yeah except about 
a robot torturing you eternally, which <laughs> at the time was a really weirdly heavily adult topic for one of those games. Yeah. That's when sure. they were making like Sam and Max hit the road and stuff, you know? R- right. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, my other one. I talked about George Saunders on the Welcome to the Monkey House episode. He wrote an introduction to an edition of Huckleberry Finn, The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn by Mark Twain. And it's uh, collected in, I think it's the Brain Dead Megaphone, one of his collections. Or you can just get the edition of Mark Twain with the Saunders intro. But it's an intro. It opens with Saunders struggling to even write an intro to Huck Finn because he loves Huck Finn so much and it's so important to him. And I really feel like it's his bombing of dresden like i gotta nail this it's gotta be amazing and then he goes into a lot about what stories mean and why we tell them and how oh you didn't mean like it's the most tragic scarring event of his life right you I meant just mean like, like how kurt's like i gotta get this right because i'm privy to the knowledge about the bombing of dresden yeah like this person's like i can't fuck up this huck finn intro yeah i have the opportunity <laughs> to do this thing that yeah. means so much to me and i need to nail it And then also Saunders talks a lot about how a narrative can be completely disjointed and crazy and seemingly random in order to execute a very specific and real uh, meaning. And and also he's an excellent writer, and so it's a great intro to check out and also i guess read huck finn if you haven't it's it really oh, moves that's great yeah, yeah that's so good, yeah, that's good. <laughs> i'll throw out two ones that people probably know about but like i feel like if we remind you or give you our seal of approval hopefully it'll just encourage you to maybe pick them up and give them a read yeah but everyone should be aware of night by eli weisel or ellie oh, weisel yes just a very short chilling account a real life account of what it was like to be in the concentration camps that if you don't know, you should expose yourself to because it happened and never forget and etc. And then the other one that reminded me, basically, it's like if Kurt Vonnegut just couldn't shut up, I feel like you would end up with Gravity's Rainbow by Thomas Pinchon, huh, never which read it. is Pinchon famously writes incredibly dense novels with thousands of characters where the plot doesn't always cohese. And Gravity's Rainbow is one of the nuttiest with a plot that is almost impossible to make sense of. But... The wry sense of humor he brings to the tragic deprivations of World War II feel exactly like Slaughterhouse Five. Yeah. Or Catch Twenty Two for that matter. Or like the best episodes are, of MASH. Those so, are the two books that I've heard are the other yeah, great. Dark if you know World the War tone I mean, this yeah. is another book in that tone that's really good. Incredibly dense and long and challenging though, so only if you're down for that. Cool. Last but not least, I want to shout out another comic book that you probably all should have already known about, Mouse. By yeah. Art Spiegelman. I just know if you're like me, there's a chance that you've heard about it, seen it. Everyone said it was good. It won all the awards. But you were like, the drawing's kind of doodly, the art style. And I already know about the Holocaust. So maybe I can give that one a pass. And it's a comic book, so maybe you didn't, blah, blah, blah. Fucking read it. It's incredible. <laughs> and it does what Slaughterhouse-Five does so well, which is balance the feeling of what it's like to be someone who is in the war and now living in a normal life, what it's like to be the child of that person and what the experience actually was like of being there at the time. Yeah. So it, it follows not in such a messed up way or unstuck way, but it follows all the timelines of like war is looming, what it's like to be in war and how it affects your family and your kids and blah, blah, blah. And it's great. Yeah. It's Mouse, M-A-U-S part one and two. If nothing else, it's one where I feel like most people traveling on the internet a lot have come to the realization of, yeah, comics can be great art. But if you haven't, Mouse is one way you will be convinced that they can. Yeah. Or if maybe you just had heard of it, never got around to it, and you hearing this will make you go, oh, yeah, I always meant to read that. I'll read that. Yeah. So Ah, do. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's all I got. Great. Well, I think we can move into a next segment called Vonnegut News. News. There's two uh two things to pull out. One is that the Kurt Vonnegut Memorial Library in Indianapolis on March sixth, they're doing a screening of a documentary they commissioned about Kurt, and they're doing a whole event that night with that. That's right, Dune. Oh, actually, I'm sorry. It's March <laughs> March 2nd. Scratch that. March 2nd. Scratch that. And then also on April 8th, they're opening uh, their new building. They're going to have a new building on a different part of Indianapolis that's much bigger and better and has a lot more going on. And then the other uh, kind of straight piece of news is that I came across an article in, it's called Nautilus. It's a blog about science, and it's about people manipulating ice and ice crystals oh. and just the way they are counting how ice works they literally generated ice nine 
They just, but that doesn't mean it does that. It just means it's the ninth version of ice they created, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's just. How I that assume works. it doesn't have world-ending properties, or we would have heard about it. <laughs> right. Well, they and they say they pull out specifically that obviously this is the same name as Kurt Vonnegut's compound in Cat's Cradle. Our actual ice nine is incredibly fragile and barely mm. holds together. And don't worry, it'll be yeah. fine. <laughs> they should have been like, obviously, yes, it has the same name as the Kurt Vonnegut ice nine, and obviously, yes. You should give us all your money or we will deploy it. <laughs> <laughs> and then they take over a small island. Exactly. And there you go. But that story in Nautilus is called The Exotic Matter States Behind PCs, Visual Displays, and the Future of Water. So it's a really interesting uh, just piece about chemistry if you want to get way into that. Or The Children's Crusade, wherein <laughs> a guy living in Cape Cod writes a title that's far too long. <laughs> And I think that's most all of the segments for this. Yeah, oh, how do yeah. you feel? I never have news. I'm, <laughs> I'm turning my pockets inside out and there's no news about Kurt Vonnegut inside. That's good. The news doesn't fit well in pockets. <laughs> um, and we're so excited that you hung out for our Slaughterhouse 5 episode. What a, what a landmark. What a thing. What a big book. What a milestone. Uh, as far as our next episodes, the next uh, novel is Breakfast of Champions. But we're going to do that two episodes from now mm -hmm. because our next episode is going to primarily be about a play Kurt wrote called Happy Birthday, Wanda June that was, I think, written in 1970, came out in 1971. So chronologically, that's next. And while we do that, we're going to touch on a couple other plays he wrote because Kurt did a lot of kind of stray playwriting throughout the 50s and 60s. Happy Birthday, Wanda June is a rewrite of a play called Penelope. We're not really going to deal with that. But we're going to mainly do Happy Birthday, Wanda June in our next episode. Also talk about a short play called Fortitude that is collected in Wamp Eater's Foma and Grand Falloons, but it's a one-act play he wrote in 1968. And then we might talk about a very short play called The Very First Christmas Morning, which was in Better Homes and Gardens in 1962. <laughs> and I haven't been able to find it yet. So if we don't find it, forget it. But we'll or talk if you about... hear this and you know where it is, send us the link and we'll yeah. make you a hero. You will be the king You'll of Bonafriends. You'll be Bonafriends. internet famous, exactly. You'll be the one. So we're, our next episode is about Happy Birthday, Wanda June, plus some assorted other playwriting drama stuff about Kurt. So that's next. And after that is Breakfast of Champions. Awesome. Can't wait. Yeah. And, and after that is the lunch of losers. And after that is the dinner of the dead. <laughs> You're familiar with his meal the trilogy. Meals. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for listening, guys. Yeah. Everything was beautiful and nothing hurt. Ow. See you next time. <laughs>